Welcome to this week's show. It really has been it's an unbelievable few weeks. I, I feel like we put out a podcast yesterday, but we we did actually, in fact, put one out only a few days ago, and it was kind of the wrapping up of our trip from the USA. But I'd completely forgotten we'd done that. I was quite surprised when it went out. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, we got back, and we've we've not. This is the first week actually back in the office in the yeah. office as such. So it kind of we came back from the US and. Haven't really been home. This is the first first few days actually home. I literally got picked up from the airport and went to another job. Yeah. <laughs> My suitcase didn't even get unpacked. My suitcase didn't even arrive. <laughs> For days. For days. I, I had to... Uh, my, my, my case got lost, lost in London and then they flew it up the following day. So this was on the Wednesday I arrived. They flew up on the Thursday and then they rang me saying that they won't deliver it until the following Wednesday because of flyby policy and not delivering over weekends and such like. And uh, we were flying on Monday. so uh, Back down to London. So I had to drive back to Edinburgh Airport to go and get my case to then repack it to then fly up on the Monday. So it's been a bit crazy. But highlight actually of that week, despite being just mad with timings and logistics, was not only did we get to go around the entire factory of Holland and Holland, as well as their shooting grounds and the uh, shooting cinema that, as well that was as the on, showroom. That was on my list to talk about, actually. Oh, was I completely it? forgot about it. Well, we got, we got we, to we, do we, that. Yeah, we can talk about it now. But the day after, we got to go and interview Sir David Attenborough for a project which should be out in the next few days after this podcast comes out, I believe. You will hear more about it in the next podcast and you'll probably hear a short interview or the opening piece of the f- the film that we produced with Sir David Attenborough. Mm. So that was uh yeah it was kind of a weird a weird 48 hours actually. It was of. yeah from from high end guns to <laughs> a national treasure yeah. in 2 days. But the Holland Holland was quite an experience wasn't it? it was, yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Obviously it's a it's a company that I've known about since as young as I was when I first was aware of guns. It's the kind of play, you know, when you go to the game fairs when you were younger, it's the kind of guns you like pressed your face against, against the, the glass, the glass yeah. to, <laughs> to have a look at. But everyone there was uh, in, in incredibly nice, incredibly helpful. They looked after us so well during the day. Uh, we got to look around the entire factory. I mean, they have a, a whole building. I don't actually know how many floors there were, but it must be at least five. Five floors. at least, yeah. Uh, probably five floors five that, we, that we were on, uh, and to see the process step by step from a block of raw, oily, <laughs> sharp steel to these incredibly magnificent high-end pieces of functional art, which some of them are, if you is if, remarkable. If you gave your average person a block of metal and a piece of wood and say, make me this gun. And you could you could give them all the money in the world, I guarantee they probably couldn't no, do it. No, no. <laughs> the, the skill and longevity of the skill sets within that company were staggering. I mean, there, there was lots of people there who had basically been there their whole life. Yeah. A- and they're training more people. And they were, yeah. That was one of the one of the cool aspects of it. They have an a, apprentice a, school, a proper apprentice scheme, and there was uh, six apprentices, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, all there learning the skills of gunsmithing, which is gun it, which is vast. Yeah, <laughs> you need to know a lot. But we're going to be uh, writing up a piece all on that trip for the next volume of Modern Huntsman and telling you all the details and sharing all the pictures when that comes out, which is going to be in the next few months. Oh, and all you lucky listeners, and we know there's a lot of you in the southeast, southeast or south of England, uh, you all get to live near that lovely clay ground. The shooting school was the, the best clay experience of my life. The best instruction I've ever had, and I'm not just saying it because they looked after us so well that day. 
we said it at the time. They're, they're not paying us to say no. that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, I learned so much in that hour and a half. I mean, we had a really busy day because we had to go and do it, take a lot of photographs. We only had, I think, probably about maybe actually only an hour on the clay ground. We were itself. not expecting to have to shoot no. to shoot or have instruction or anything like that when we when we arrived, and I, I am better for it. I'm 100% better for it. I was told things that I'd never been told in 20 years of shooting shotguns. So, so I just hope I can remember them, <laughs> implement them next time I go out. We just have to go to the playground more often. Yeah. But well, uh, Don't forget the shooting cinema. And the shooting cinema. But I was going to say, if you do, do live around that area, I would definitely go along. It was 30 minutes outside London, outside the centre of London. Inside the M25. Yes, exactly. I, d- I don't exactly know where it was, but no, I'm I pretty sure either. if you typed in... Um, Holland and Holland shooting school. Shooting I think school. it's on Holland and Holland yeah. website. Then uh, you will find it. But it, I would... It's definitely worth going to do. And we actually know a number of other people that have also done it. And they've basically said exactly the same things we've said. It's it's where I would be going in the weeks leading up to the start of the shooting season. If it was closer. I'm not going to travel all the way down the country for a week in, week out to get practice. But... Hopefully I can carry with some of those tips that we were given onto the clay ground here. But if you live down there, there's no excuse. Just get yourself down there. And like you said, the shooting cinema. Yeah, which is the only one in the country. So for those people, it's a more common thing in Europe. Uh, but for those people that don't know what we're talking about, Sam did discuss it briefly on the, the podcast with him at the start of the year. But it's essentially um, a cinema screen like a projector so you're watching proper video of game running in front of you and you shoot an actual rifle it's not an electronic button shooting a laser or anything you are shooting a rifle whatever rifle i think they got i think they said they went up to 500 nitro in that yeah the thing they, they were limited i'm sure the limit was 500 nitro so basically anything that you can dream you can shoot in there and so you can go and shoot the actual rifle that you're going to go and take on a driven hunt on what is essential, what essentially looks like real it's, animals. It's a cinema screen, yeah. so it's it's not a uh, like often you do get in some of these um, other ones I've used simulators, but where it's a computer animation that comes up. These are re- the real deal. It's the real animals coming out. Well, uh, not not physically the real, but, but in they were picture, they were real. real yeah, and I think one of the great things about it is unlike uh, just moving targets on like a pulley system, which I've shot quite a lot which are very, um, you know, they, they move left to right. They, they don't have much dimension about them. They're predictable in yeah. after a, a number after of goes. A while. Yeah. This, they could be coming at any time. You don't get the cue of the, the motor whirring up and rattling this the target back and forward. They can be coming down at an angle and across, straight towards you. So you really do have to think. And the yeah, beauty I mean, of it is that you get an immediate response. Yeah, so you, you pull the trigger. You can have animals crossing, so it's all those kind of situations w- which very well may happen in real life where you, where the shot is, you can't take it because there's an animal standing right behind it. Yeah. And it's these all these little situations that you don't think about uh, but can happen. Yeah. So, uh, again, and it's also really fun. It is it? a lot of fun. We could have put a lot more yeah. ammo than we did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, definitely another place that is a must visit if you're going to go shoot driven game. In it's in the same place. Yeah. It's all in the same, and it was getting a revamp when we were there. So, yeah, I imagine it'll probably be done next even week. plusher than it was yeah. when we went. Yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, that was our busy couple of weeks after getting back from the states. And I, I can't wait to share with everybody the the short film for the year of the salmon. If you didn't know, it's the international year of the salmon this year, 2019, <laughs> and that is what we would. Um, interviewing Sir David Attenborough about, um, but we'll share you share with you. We'll put it on the next show, and we'll talk a bit more about when it's actually out so. and everyone involved in yeah. it because it wasn't just us who was yeah. involved in putting that together. Yeah, so when we when we can tell you, we'll tell you more. Yeah. What's next? Well, we have the winner from last week's, not well, two weeks ago, the competition, which was to win a CZ doormat. And the winner, I don't know what the name of the person is, but... I should have looked. I think, I think it was actually on his was it? Instagram, but it doesn't matter. He'll know who he is. A Hill Farmer yeah. is the Instagram account. So contact us. We'll get your CZ doormat out. And of course, we've got another competition, a new one for this podcast. We're going to throw in another CZ doormat, and we're going to add to it a Hornady Reloading with Rosie mug. Two incredibly popular items when it comes to prizes with the podcast. And all we want you to tell us is what rimfire do you use? 
So we'll put up, a, you feel free to email the show. We'll also put up social posts and we'll put it in our story on Instagram and just reply however you want to communicate with us and tell us what rimfire you use. What is in your cupboard? For us, I was just trying to think if there was any exception to this, but there isn't. For all of us, all three of us, my myself, my dad, my brother, we're all CZs. <laughs> it's just happened like that. They just work and they're good value for money. Yeah. Can't go too wrong. No. They don't fail. No, they, well, they haven't. I, yeah, not yet. The ammunition has, but no, not on the, not on the, not on the two twos. No, not on the two two. Yeah, one seven ammo can sometimes could be a little bit yeah. of a pain in the butt. But no, the rifles <laughs> have functioned flawlessly from day one. So that's what we we would like you to do. And in two weeks' time, we will announce the winner. Did you have anything else? I've only got the uh, email that I wanted to read out. To no, me. I was just about to say the new competition, but that's exactly what you just said. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, Your brain so, is not in gear. So I'm, I'm one behind. So we receive a lot of emails in the show, and we really love receiving emails from you. A lot of them are commenting on various guests that we've had, uh, some giving a bit of feedback, recommendations for new guests. And very often it's people just sharing a story with us, which, yes. is, which is great to read. And we heard from one gent last week, and I asked him if he didn't want us to ID who he was, and you'll understand why, uh, but I asked him if I could share a couple of the paragraphs from the email that he wrote. Now, he's a teacher down south, and I'm just going to uh, uh, read you what he wrote. I asked him in his reply, he told us a story, and I said, "Would do you think that... Um, or how do you feel the perception of hunting is in the sort of school environment? Is it something you can talk about? I was just curious because he was a teacher. And this is the email that he wrote back. And he said, um, sadly, I don't think it would go down well if I openly talked about hunting. I don't think it would be seen as professional. I'll be honest, nobody I work with knows anything about it. I have a separate Instagram account that I use for all my shooting and hunting related things. I only talk about it on private groups on Facebook. Only my direct family and close friends know that I hunt. It's a shame that I feel the need to keep a such such a large part of myself a secret, but unfortunately that's the way it is. How sad is that? Very How sad. sad it is is it that something that is and can or can be or is completely legal and can be completely ethically justified somebody feels like they have to keep it it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a drug addiction, like yeah. a secret drug addiction, trying to keep it quiet. It's, um, but yeah, I, it really, but really, I, really I, touched me when I, when I read that, because it's really sad. But I do understand why. Yeah, and I totally understand. Yeah. It's just very sad that we live in a society where people have to hide something like that. Yeah, and if you, if you just take the clock back 20, 30 years... That, that you wouldn't have even got an email like that. People would have talked about it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we we need to fix this, people, our community. We can't have a situation in the future where individuals feel th- that they cannot discuss what they openly enjoy and is a legitimate part of who we are. We can't have a situation where this gets pushed underground because that's exactly what this is. So hopefully that's what we're doing with the podcast, education. Yeah, and there's been a lot of people, new listeners, the last uh, few weeks. I think quite a few maybe even migrated over from uh, Ben's podcast. Yes. We had a show out with Ben. It was actually, we did not time it like this, Uh, but our show came out where we interviewed Ben and then the week after his show came out where he interviewed us yeah uh, and we like 5 days we, we actually had a lot of people from his podcast coming over and emailing us saying i've started listening to your podcast or i heard about you on so welcome on, on his podcast yeah. so if you are one of those listeners welcome welcome to our our show i know a lot of you like to start from podcast 1 and work way back but i encourage you to keep up to date with it while you do the back catalog yeah. and um yeah the, the first podcast i i don't actually even want to re-listen to them to be honest because <laughs> i'm sure they're you know terrible compared to what they are now uh, <laughs> you learn and improve yeah. that's the point of it uh and i think that's it the only thing left to do is introduce you all to our guest which was another one of our podcasts recorded in the states uh, with a gent called Brett Seng, 
who is a fishing guide and photographer. Does a lot of photography for Sitka, so you've probably seen his stuff, even if you didn't realise it was him. Uh, we didn't know Brett before we went out to the States. He was introduced to us by a friend. We went over to, uh, to his house and enjoyed a really great dinner, got to see his man cave and his uh, underground shooting range, which you're going to hear about in the podcast. And he was just an all-round nice guy, and I yeah. thoroughly enjoyed the podcast. If you are into fishing, you'll really like this this podcast mm. as well. Uh, we we do talk quite a bit about fly fishing, so a little bit of everything for everyone in this one, I I, I think. And before we let you go and enjoy the the show, we want to remind you, and you may have only just heard of this on this show, but hopefully not, uh, that the auction for raising funds for the pangolin are. It started. They're on. They're on Facebook. The first few items have already closed. Yes, but we did give you forewarning on the podcast we, and on social media. We are getting close to fairly close to the thousand pound mark. Yeah, we're already. getting there. So we've um, we've had a whole heap of very generous donations, um, signed Donny Vincent DVDs from Donny Vincent himself. We had a, an Otis uh, cleaning kit from Moray Outfitters. Um, Thomas Jacks gave us a whole like Gerber combo kit. Those are all already gone, and um, a Leopold thermal mud, mug, which came from uh, from the guys at Leopold. So they're already done and spoken for. But uh, tonight, after this podcast goes out, or maybe tomorrow, uh, the next lot of stuff will close. So we've got a Hornady bag up for grabs. We've got a baseball cap from Winterberg Safaris from our good friend Dear von der Lange, donated that when he was over. We've got a 20-gauge Beretta cleaning kit and then like a little pouch for your shotgun. And we've also got a subscription for from iFlies.co.uk uh, where you will get either 10 trout flies or 5 salmon flies per month for 6 months. So all of those are currently on our website. If you go to thepacebrothers.com and you'll find the Pangolin Auction tab, just click it. All the information's there and how you bid. Or you can go over to Pace Brothers on Facebook and all the items are also there with all of the information. And probably today, and if not today, tomorrow, uh, when this podcast goes out, there will be a whole bunch of other stuff. So we've got uh, leather knife sheaths. We've had a very kind offer from an artist to do a portrait um, of a dog if you win uh, that auction. I've got another signed Donny Vincent DVD, a couple of other things from Leopold and uh, we've got rugby tickets coming up. Yes, we do. Kindly donated by my brother. Yeah, um, Scotland versus France in, uh, I think it's August, August 24th this year. Uh, it will be, it always is a good game at Murrayfield. And the last 18 games or something crazy have been sold out. So if you wait too long, the chances of even getting these tickets are slim. They're also some of the best ticket seats in the house. So they're worth, they're worth, I think... The problem is I buy season tickets, so I'm not 100% sure, but they will be worth about £50, pounds, 50 to £60 pounds a, a ticket, um, a seat. And uh, there's two seats up for grabs, so that'll be a good one. Well, everybody has given incredibly generously oh, so far. Torch from um, Scott Country. Oh, yes, yeah, because that just got added that yet, just got yesterday. Added yesterday. So it's not up yet, but there, there is... Um I think it's a lamp for the top of your gun, isn't it? Don't yeah, I think more details. It's, it's worth about £100. So okay. that's All of that stuff is going up. The point is, you don't want to miss out. One, because you'll be helping a great cause, uh, raising we're, most of this money is going to go into buying camera traps for the guys on the ground who are doing the research with pangolins. And I'm going to be taking them uh, myself in April this year. So we're going to be buying the camera traps and taking them over and handing to them, uh, handing it to them personally. But don't miss out. Go to thepacebrothers.com, click Pangolin Auction. All the stuff will be there. Lots of great uh, items coming up. So just keep refreshed on that and get bidding. Yes, definitely. Get, get bidding. Uh, and when this podcast goes out, uh, by the time it goes out, there'll also be a donate button on our website so uh, i think the minimum donation i'm not sure what i'll have to put it at because there's obviously fees involved um so it might be it might be five pounds or something for for the the minimum donation but like we did with the chimpanzees we 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 made the target and we we appreciate it not not just us 
it's the it's the people that are going to be receiving this uh, or appreciating it, it are going to appreciate it even more and we get messages from them almost daily you got so, a whole new bunch of videos and stuff recently, yeah didn't you? saying thank you that from the bottom of their heart thank you to everyone that has donated so far and not just money but the the, the prizes mm. or the auction lots uh, because this is going to make a real difference and we're going to um, take pictures and some film while, uh, while Byron's over there. And what's really cool about this is it's not very often when you get to donate money and actually then you'll have physical... Uh, I don't know, you'll you'll actually get something in return because we'll get some of the footage from the, the cameras. Yeah, absolutely. So you'll get to see what your money is actually doing on the ground. And we've we've got videos from traps that are already out there and there's like leopard walking past them and hyena and it's it's crazy what they're capturing on on these cameras uh, all for the pangolin. Mm -hmm. And we're uh, working and discussing with some companies behind the scenes for some for some other efforts to do with the research which I can't share with you right now but uh, there is something pretty cool going on which hopefully we can tell you about very soon. And just lastly, it is not too late for you to donate a, an auction lot. If you'd like to give us something um, to put up on auction, a lot of people responded to our request on the podcast when we first mentioned it, and that's how a lot of the extra items have come. So thank you very much to everybody who has emailed in and offered up a lot. Brett, thank you very much for having us in your home tonight. Of to course. this podcast. I'm glad to have you guys, and welcome to Montana. It's, it's been thank great. You. It's treated us well very uh, so far. You really uh, like still got a few days to go. Stepping it up large, coming to Montana first. I mean, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm kind of like a little I'm, biased. I'm a little biased, right? <laughs> exactly. No, it has. It's been, it's been great, and I'm looking forward to the next few days as well. But I'm going to start this podcast by the thing that blew me away the most. <laughs> Walking into your house, you offered us a drink, went downstairs, and you've got an indoor range for your bow. <laughs> Just describe this for me, because maybe that doesn't sound so cool. But when you explain how you did it. I think people are going to be like, are you mad? <laughs> well, you know, I always wanted a little man cave and I get walking into a closet space and seeing what you can do with it. I wanted a place where I could work on my bows and that works great for the right hand half. And then I had, it's 30 feet in there. So you had a 10 yard range that you could shoot small spot. Um, that was the idea in the beginning. And then a couple of whiskey drinks with some good friends. And we talked about cutting a hole in the foundation That's wall. That's how old good ideas start. Absolutely. <laughs> in good whiskey. And so we're just sitting there talking about it. And I have one friend that's just got, you know, comes out of left field, but he's got great ideas. And he's a great carpenter too. And so he brought it up and I just basically started looking for stop signs. Why couldn't I do this? <laughs> and so I had a, a friend that's an engineer come over and say, you know, there's no weight bearing on this wall. You could totally cut a hole in it. So... <laughs> So we go outside and we start looking around. There's like nothing in the way. There's no like water line. There's, you know, the gas is on the other side of the house. The power's on the other side of the house. That's, that's do this. And, um, Allie's amazing. I, I'm, I'm going to marry the most amazing chick ever. She's just like, I told her the idea and she's like, <laughs> hell yeah, do it. <laughs> and so, and we got busy with it in, in the spring of last year. It took about three weeks to do and, yeah, we dug a trench along the foundation wall that's 50 feet long, and then we put 36-inch corrugated drain pipe in there and uh, put L uh, angle iron in there to make a rail system so you can shoot 20 yards in the basement. It's kind of cool. It's unbelievable. <laughs> we, we actually, you took a video of it, didn't you, John? I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's on, on our, well, it was on our Instagram. You can go back and have a look at the story. <laughs> oh, so the, very the, cool. The inspiration behind it was was learning how to shoot target archery um i've shot a hunting bow since i was 12 years old um shot a, a bunch of different types of bows but i've never tried to hit an x at 20 yards 30 times in a row and i've been told that it's very hard and very humbling and very frustrating and very intriguing at the same time and it's let me tell you it's like it, it is a black hole of unproductivity if you start to go down this you're just like like wipe out Everything else that you, well, let's start. Let's go back. Uh, we can edit some of this, right? Or is this? <laughs> no, just, we're no, not, no, 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 we're no, going to no, keep we your fumble in. <laughs> <Yeah>. Awesome. 
Uh, Even so, better. Well, what I mean by a black hole is like once you go down this rabbit hole. So where does it end? Yeah, where does it end? Well, you like, were showing us the size of the target, and it's, yeah. it's like it was like a ten pence piece the, for the UK list. If you're shooting such precision shots like that, does that mean you? Every time you take the shot, you have to pull the target back because you have the risk of hitting the arrow again. Well, you don't shoot the same target twice. Okay, so that's why there's three. Yeah, okay. there's three targets there, and you're trying to hit inside the 10 ring, if not the X ring, um, every time for 30 shots in a row. 30 or 10 ends. So you shoot three arrows, that's an end. You go up, pull your arrows, go back to the line, shoot it again. And I can do it like six times, seven times, seven ends in a row, but it's the eighth one. That one shot that you're not right on, that you you didn't like go back and be a machine on, and you're in the ten, you're in the nine ring, and it's over. And so you have you achieved thirty in in the? No, no I yet. haven't. I've achieved twenty two, oh, okay. and then I miss. And I'm I'm a couple minutes into it, so give me a give me a little bit of a break here. I like <sighs> give me in like another year with this. Yeah. But what's intriguing is that it, it, you have to be perfect, and. um I love that. I'm learning a lot about archery, and it's actually it's making me a better shot um, on my 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 other hunting bows. Um, I'm just taking more time to like think about it. Like just because you made 21 shots, great, doesn't mean that your 20 seconds going to be great. You know what I mean? And so kind of doing this new skill set brought you. Does it bring you down a level? It's humbled it's like, the hell out of me. Absolutely. Build it back up. Yeah. Yeah, break me down and build me back up. <laughs> Just like the military. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Where it's, did hunting start for you? If you started shooting with a bow at 12 years old, what was your early experiences of hunting, fishing? Did you grow up here in Montana? No, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in the Midwest in a county that is, um, well, to back up a little further, I'm born and raised on a farm, and we had enough acreage there to do some whitetail hunting. We have great whitetail hunting in our county. Um the deer die of old age in our county because it's archery only. Okay, so there's there's no rifle season, there's no shotgun, no muzzle loader, nothing. So um, the fact that these animals can run throughout this county and have their way and have very limited access to actual archery hunting, um, that that's really where it all started was having an opportunity to hunt our land was the only way to do it was with a bow. And I had, my my father had let some friends out there um, he was, a, he's a great barter. He's, he's a horse trader by trade. That's what he does. <laughs> he buys and sells horses. And, um, in the, the figurative speech of horse trading, he would horse trade for someone who would be a mechanic or they'd be a welder or whatever. And they wanted to come do some bow hunting. So he'd let them bow hunt the property. And of course, once in a while they'd, they come out in the fall and do a couple of days, but he'd always have some kind of trade that he'd do on the back end. Well, one of these guys was kind enough to say, Hey, do you think your son would want to go sit in a tree? and see what this is like. And he asked me to go one afternoon. I had nothing going on. Um, I, I jumped in the tree with him. He put me on a limb like eight feet off the ground. I thought I, f I felt like I was sitting on the moon. And I At saw, that age, you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like the scale was just insane. And, and we had a lot of deer come by us that night. And a lot of deer in the Midwest is like, I saw three that night. You know, that's a lot of deer. Um, so just to have, I remember this, you know, a, a doe with her fawn come by at like maybe 30 yards or so. Um, it was just amazing to watch that come, that, that come, that, that transition of them coming from the deep, dense forest and hearing nothing to hearing this ch -ch 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 -ch, and like listening to that pattern and then them stepping out in the alfalfa field that night. It was awesome. I got to experience the whole thing. And, and then I had no idea about archery at all at that level. I just, at that point, I knew nothing about archery. And all I knew is that I was sitting in a tree watching deer um, during deer season. And there's a guy beside you. Well, he wasn't even in a tree. He was in. He was back further in the forest. Oh right. Yeah. So you're just being left to observe. Yeah, I was left there to observe. He's actually having me like, hey, if any big bucks, or like, <laughs> let me know what bucks come out in this field tonight, because so he was like a trail. You were being the trail camera for the night. He is a great. He's a great hunter. He hunted 200 yards inside the forest. He knew where the big deer was going to be moving back there. But he said, if he gets by me and he comes out in the field, I want to know what's out here. But just let me know what happens out here, because um, he never sits on the field's edge. So, anyways, that's what I was doing that night, and I did it a couple more times. And then that spring, my dad took me to our local archery shop, and I bought a Ben Pearson bow. He bought me a Ben Pearson bow, and um, that's where it really started. He bought me two dozen arrows to start with. I think the first day that I shot that bow, I lost 16 of them. <laughs> 
and my, in the grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My grandma was out there helping me, and you know, we were like, we were learning. I, to this day, I learned tricks that I still use to this day. I learned that day. She was taking my arrows and dragging them through the grass. And like when you hear a tick, that meant you went over another arrow. So she's out there dragging arrows. And um, we brought a pitchfork out there. We're like dragging that across because it's got more prongs on it. And so we're hearing all this tinging. And um, we did find the majority of the arrows. But, I mean, it just took a couple more days and they were gone. <laughs> uh, just shooting a, a, a bale hit. Addictive. Yeah, it was just super addictive. Absolutely. It's like, can I, you know? But at that point, it's not even it's not even about the hunting. It's about the activity of bow shooting. Yeah, there, there's something therapeutic about shooting your bow. Mm. I mean, to this very day, I, I love it. It cleans my slate. I shoot my bow every single day. I love coming down here and just... So that's your decompression. Yeah, I shoot, shoot a couple shots, like at least at least four or five ends before a cup of coffee in the morning because you shoot differently before caffeine. Yeah. It's a totally different game after you have a cup of coffee. Negative. Yeah, negative. Sure. Yeah. And then I'll shoot a couple about, you know, later in the afternoon, I'll come down here and I'll get frustrated with something. Something through the day frustrates you. And you come down here and, and clean your slate again. And then it's just, it's a way of just constantly, slowly, easy, small, little clean slates all day long. And at the end of the day, I'm a really happy person because of it. I need to shoot my bow more. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I don't know. Everyone has their thing, you know, to each his own. But for me, it's archery. And where did, where was the next step for you then from, obviously you were practicing so you could be proficient at something that you were now enthused by. But where did, when did you take that to what you had initially experienced, which was actually a hunt? I was lucky to have the opportunity to have the, the hunting so close to my home when I was growing up there at the farm. And then when it came time to go to college, Montana State University was like, really intriguing place right and at the time <laughs> we I drove past on the way here uh, yeah, yeah great college great i had a great education here and bozeman montana at the time was this little podunk cow town um it really was it was there was dirt road it's on. all happening now oh yeah man that's changed so much I really could, yeah you, well it'd be impossible for you to understand where it was yeah but at the time when I saw it the first time, I was 16 years old. We came out here to visit this, the university, and at the time I was really big into skiing. And my parents were just praying for snow like no other. Like no ski bums ever prayed for snow. My parents are praying for snow because they want me to come here. They want me to get away from Illinois. They want me to see the West. They love Montana. And they're just crossing their fingers praying for snow. And then we come out here, and we had like a two-foot day, I think twice that week while we visited at Big Sky. And then I decided right then and there, like, I don't give a shit what kind of education I get here. I'm, <laughs> I'm never leaving. Yeah, I'll I'm leave it. here. And, of course, like, the peripheral things of the outdoors here are attractive, for sure. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to study, but I knew I wanted to be in the outdoors. I know I wanted to have things like this to distract me. My, my father was really adamant about having these kind of distractions. I had an opportunity to play football uh, back at home, back in the Midwest. And my dad's really like, you know... I don't see you really going to the NFL. We don't have that size in our family. You're a great football. You're a great athlete, but you're. It, it, you really should think about going to Montana. I remember him being really persuasive about that. I ended up coming here. Thank God, as 18 years old, um, I didn't hunt for the first year. I was just kind of getting my feet wet, like just fishing around here, just understanding that, and learning about fly fishing. I never fly fished before I came here. Ever. You you picked a pretty decent place to, I mean, it's the like best, a global the mecca. mecca. Oh, yeah. dude, absolutely. And I've traveled all over the world fly fishing for trout, and I realized all it's done is made me appreciate where I live where right here, here in Montana. Yeah, absolutely. You so think, what did you study then? Environmental science. Oh, okay. So I see the connection here. I started in photography. I had a teacher, Rachel <laughs> Laundrie, I'll circle. never well, forget her. <laughs> okay. She talked me out of it. She said, you have bad composition. I don't really see your, you going anywhere with that. You should consider changing your major. Uh, she beat me to death on all my composition, and I, I was at the time, you know, 18 years old. You're 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 insecure. You don't know what you're supposed. You, you listen to any adult telling you what you're going to do, what you're what you're supposed to be good at, right? These are the advisors that we're yeah. expecting to tell you us what trust we're somebody. good at. Exactly, and um, is raised to trust adults and 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 um, respect their opinion. So listening to her i was like yeah i'll change it you know so i did environmental science because i was intrigued by the outdoors i was intrigued by soil science in, in particular so i went through and, and got an education in that and um only later 
that through that process, I was working as a trout fishing guide here in Bozeman. I was making great While money. you were at university. Yeah, yeah, in the summertime. <laughs> in the summertime. It was a great job. Um, it sounds like it's better yeah. than cutting grass. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Abs- <laughs> or working in a cafe. <laughs> I wish I could have been a trout guide. Absolutely. When you when you break it down per hour, and I mean, come on, first world problems, you're trying to catch a trout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how stressful can this possibly be? And There's a lot of foreigners or... Uh, a lot of people from all over the world, yeah. and I've been so fortunate to have the job for that particular reason. You have so much insight from so many different people that come out here to try to relax. And when you get somebody in a boat that wants to relax for the day and not talk about work or anything like that, you really get some really cool perspective and insight on their life. And honestly, that was the most life-changing thing that happened here in Bozeman, in Montana, anywhere. Um, that job changed the way that I live life every single day because of having that many people tell you the same, have the same kind of story over and over throughout the years. Basically the thing is that the premise that I got was enjoy your life, have balance, live your life. Now you can do, do everything you can to plan for your, your future. Of course. I mean, be responsible, but in, don't forget that the, like the whole life isn't a destination, you know, like enjoy that. You know, it sounds so cliche to say all this You're stuff. You're 100% right. But enjoy your path. And these guys would get in the boat and they're like, yeah, I'm I'm wealthy, of course. But I'm, I'm also divorced. I've been married twice. My kids don't talk to me. And I'm out here learning how to fly fish at 55. And I hate my job. Exactly. And I can tell you about the things I own. And you can tell me about the things that you've done and the places you've seen. And I don't know who's richer. And... Honestly, when you hear that over and over and over, it changes your perspective completely. And that's kind of, that's, I'm living pretty much the premise of that. It's, it's so, I had a very similar discussion with a girl called uh, Jenna Gearing on, on this podcast. And she was talking about her kind of, she's, she's quite young, uh, in her mid twenties. And she talked about the, the journey that she had, had taken. She had properly lived spending time in South America just working on ranches and actually living and experiencing things rather than just working to an end goal, realizing that the journey that that you go on to get there is also really important because that's actually most of your life. And the amount of people that gave us feedback on the podcast saying, you know, I remember this one guy's like, I'm 40 years old and I listen to this podcast of this young girl and I realize that I've like wasted my life to this point. But he was enthused enough by it to think, to to also write in the email. I realize now I need to do something different. And now yes. you're you, this is very similar to the story that you're telling now, where you're hearing from all these people who probably realize a little bit too late that you really got to try and enjoy yourself and do something that means something to you. Yes. Incidentally, she's a bronze sculpture uh, oh, artist yeah. like she your is. mom. Yeah. Oh, awesome! Yeah. Well, man, you know, like. Uh, Finding personal happiness is everything, right? Like Ali says this all the time. You can't pour from an empty cup. If you're not personally happy, how the hell can you be happy for anybody else around you? And I live by that. I love that, you know, and I I respect it. I think I wake up thinking about that. Make yourself happy first and you can be happy for everyone around you. And at the end of the day, man, that's what's important. You know? So I'm I'm living it. You guys are So that was your lucky sky love. That was your uh, that was your catalyst, I guess. That yes. experience. Yes, and it still is. I still outfit here in Bozeman. I've been doing it for sixteen years. I, I do it as a reminder, almost. I mean, I of so course still love the job. Fishing. Yeah, ah. absolutely. In the summertime. Yep, I guide <laughs> um, here in the Yellowstone, the Madison, uh, the Jefferson, and I guide a little bit on the Big Hole and Beaverhead still. But I bounce around the state a bunch. Um, I guided in South America. I've done a little bit in New Zealand. Um, yeah, I've gotten to travel and fish trout all over the world. It's been great. It's like, that's I'm not really even a job, lucky. man. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> it's I know not it. even a job. I know it. I know it's ridiculous. It's uh, absolutely ridiculous. I remember. So when, when we were making the comments at dinner that we need to come back and do some trout fishing. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm your guy. I, I, love, I, I know a guy, the trout absolutely. king here. <laughs> the trout king. Okay, I have a request, though. You need to tell me where, where if it actually exists as it was in the movie. Because my one of the reasons that Montana has always been so highly held for me in terms of locations i got to go through my life is because of a river runs through it of course what does the river that they fished in there is it the same river that they named in the film is it the mighty bigfoot well they talk about the blackfoot blackfoot sorry yeah yep and um 
Bigfoot, mighty Bigfoot. Now the Bigfoot works. I've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of it was filmed on the Gallatin River down by Big Sky. Okay. Quite a bit of it. I can take you right. To, I'll take you right to the rock that Brad Pitt's thrown at the whatever the shadow cast. That's not true. It's it's a false cast. It's like. But the rock exists. The rock exists, and that's about the only truth to that. Yeah. I, I'll There's go no with that. I'll go to the that rock. Happens to make a cast. Yeah. <laughs> You get a dead drift and you catch a trout here. It was very poetic, <laughs> though. It was very poetic. Yeah. It was an amazing movie. It's an amazing story. Even today, it's an amazing movie. Absolutely. Yeah, like timeless. It's amazing. And and that is a lot of the things that intrigued me about Montana, watching that movie. I mean, I know that my father watched that and was like, yeah, my son's going to move to Montana. I'm going to talk him into it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe he's going to become a journalist And maybe and, for the local paper. And mm-hmm. they've always been huge advocates of whatever you want to do for your living, we're, we're 100% percent behind you so go do it absolutely when i told him i was going to be a photographer at 30 years old when i wanted to be a professional photographer and one of the most saturated things i could possibly think of as far as like shooting fly fishing for a living yeah. they're like yes go do it do it you know like it, it, it's amazing i hope that i can be the parents they've been because they felt that because you were passionate about it that was that this, was all you needed to make a success of it. yes and i and i think absolutely that passion has a lot to do with that Absolutely. No, I agree with that. It's like almost stubborn, blind passion. You know what I mean? Like put all the, the money in actually making your, paying your bills and what aside to put blinders on and say, I'm passionate about this. I'm going to strive and I'm going to be stubborn and I'm going to go for the it. The best you can be at it. Absolutely. And you so can, what, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt you there, but I, I realize that we've missed a little time. <laughs> we've <laughs> but, missed a second in years. life because you're now yeah. 30 years old and you're a photographer, but yeah, you finish your university doing your environmental science did you did you then go on and use it or were I you, did I worked did. as I worked as a ranch property manager here in in Montana for a, a quite a big ranch right over here in Manhattan Montana and we got to do a really cool projects there to restore not only like soils there but we also did some stream restoration projects there um Bud Lilly lived on the property Bud Lilly's like the he's like the founding father he's one of the founding fathers of fly fishing in montana i mean really he's the man um named bud lily anywhere around here and people will know who he is and he lived on the property um and i got to drink a cup of coffee with him for two years straight it was awesome <laughs> uh we wake up in the morning wow. i go out there and before i started my work we'd sit down and have a conversation and then i go about my day and um it was, that was one of the peripheral advantages of having that but at the end of the day i wanted to go back to guiding I wanted to be in the boat with people from all over the world, different backgrounds, and telling me their story. And I've, I'm, I'm a good listener. I'm good at sitting there in the boat. I'm not saying that I'm your psychologist for the day, but if people want to get in the boat and tell me about their lives, I think it, I find it super intriguing. So I sit there and I listen and I ask some questions. And man, I've had so much marriage advice; it's insane. <laughs> um, I, I'm not married yet, but yeah. I ask every single one of them that tell me they've been married for more than 10 years. I'm like, what's your secret? And I've had all types of answers. But Well, I got to know. Oh, man. Because I'm not married yet. He is. He's a few years <laughs> in. <laughs> you know, quality time together, quality time apart. That's what I've been told by the most successful ones. Yeah? Yeah. I, that, was a, that was from a man that was married for 60 years. Yeah. I like that. That's very... Quality time together and quality simple, time Simple, but... Beautiful. You know who said that? He said that. He had his wife in the boat. She said quality time apart. He said quality time together. <laughs> she said quality time apart. So you combine the two. Yeah, you combine the and two. And you got happiness. And it just basically boils down to balance. Yeah, absolutely. I just like their perspective. I enjoy having that pe- that kind of people in the boat that want to relax. You catch them on a different level, you know. You're taking all types of different people, CEOs. You're taking um, mailmen that have been saving up for 10 years to go fly fishing. You all different across all different spectrums of background and from all over the place geographically and you get them in the boat and you start picking their brain about life and you come up with some pretty cool perspectives it's one of the reasons that we love doing the podcast yeah it is it's because we get to speak to people to like meet, you yeah exactly yeah from all over the world face-to-face conversations are are the best you know we've Absolutely. been fortunate enough to have be in your house and have dinner with you and that so it's great to be able to shoot the shit before and then we do it and do a podcast some of them are over the phone from the other side of the world, like over Skype or something. But ultimately, we get to have com- awesome conversations with really great people from all over the place. And it makes it makes me as a person kind of feel more complete, but also realize all the stuff I don't know when you, when you speak to people and learn from their experiences. It's exciting, though. It is. It means you don't know everything yet. It's never... <laughs> 
it's not possible to know everything. But <laughs> just reminding yourself of that every now and then is yeah, is good. Life needs to be humbling, right? Yeah. I mean, it has to be like that. So from guiding, where did the photog- what did it go straight from guiding to photography, or did you suddenly start taking pictures while you were guiding? That's how I imagine the sort of transition to be. I wanted at some point to. I just wanted this. I wanted international status as a fishing guide. Okay. And I'll just say it, you know, the vanity behind it. I wanted to be known to be able to catch trout or take people and guide them into trout anywhere. And I had my first job opportunity in Chile. And when I was down there, um, my, my, my mother and father from the Midwest of Illinois are like, what are you doing now? Where is this place? What does it look like? They don't under, they'd never been to South America before. So, of course, I took a camera with me to back up. Before that, I was doing some modeling on the side too for Sims Fly Fishing Products. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. in here in Bozeman. Um, I Brian... did not know they were out here. Mm-hmm. They're, yeah, they've so like the, found... the big waiter brand in the world still. Yeah, right here in Bozeman. Been here for a long, long time. Hmm. Kicking ass. Um, Brian Grossenbacher was their photographer at the time. I got to do a lot of traveling with him. He was an outfitter that I worked underneath. Uh, you have to apprentice under an outfitter here in Montana. They take it very seriously as far as like Guiding. the steps of being a guide. Yeah, yeah, you can't just open up shop and start handing out business cards and take people down the river. Yeah. You have to go through a process. That's good, though. It is good. Um, and it's protected our industry here in Montana. And working for Brian for a number of years, um, I got to travel around and do a bunch of modeling, basically catching fish in front of his lens. <laughs> And I saw how his life was, and I was like, man, this is awesome. This is a cool like, life. Yeah, this is great. Like, in the pressure of catching fish, like, I never really had that, you know? And um, I think we came home with great asset, re- regardless of whether we caught fish or not. I felt like I knew what he wanted as far as, like, I understood light. I understood photography. I, I understood the candidness that you need to to get great photography. And An that's honest photography. Need. Yes authentic, candid, organic experiences. And when that happens, when that magic happens, whether it's a fish caught or not, you know, you get great stuff. And Brian's the kind of guy that's, he's going to be, he's going to be right there when that happens. So, um, on the level of just kind of learning how he did his job by just watching him, um, it inspired me. And so again, Going back to the guiding thing, I was traveling. I was taking photos to tell stories to my parents and my family back at home of what I was doing all winter long. And at one point, I started flirting with the idea of actually trying to do this professionally. And that was in 2010 or 11. Despite what your earlier lecturer had said. Yes, yes. Despite (laughs) what Rachel Laundrin told me in 2001 that I was, you had bad composition, whatever. I, I, I was smart. I was. I'm lucky enough to ignore what she said, but not early enough. I should have stuck with it when I when I had the opportunity to get a great education behind it there at Montana State. I'm not regretting what I did. I'm just saying that I should have ignored her. It was like. But equally, I, I can think of, and I'm sure this is true for most people, that there are little crossroads in your life. You're like, shit. I wish I'd done that instead. But you might not be sitting where you're sitting right now. Dude, that's where the lesson was, right? I mean, if you you know you. If you listen to it, that was where your lesson was. And if you're lucky, you make the mistake once. So getting to that point and, and sh- you know, basically making the effort in 2012 to be a professional photographer. It's not was, that long ago. No, it's not that long ago at all. Um, and so much has been done since then. It feels like a long time ago. But making that leap was just, you know, I, I, I think – it took every bit of confidence I had in myself to try to do that. And then I just said, you know, things are built in five years. So you, you get a yes or no in five years of pushing on something. So give it five years and see where it goes. And to make a long story short, I get stuck in a position right now. Not stuck at all, but I mean, I've worked myself into a position where um, I still sell photos to the fly fishing industry, um, Orvis in particular. And I still work now, currently working as a tier one photographer for for Sika and for Matthews Archery, two really? great companies that I really enjoy working for. And going back to starting photography, I started making a living at this when I started saying no to a lot of people for free images okay. and for bartering for gear. That's when I started actually getting a check. And um, I understand in the beginning some people feel like they got to give away their work. But what they understand, what they will understand is if they do make it to a professional level, that all that work they gave away, they didn't need to. 
They just and you can't have... eat and you can't eat jackets. No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of uh, I sometimes think that people and also companies forget that. Yeah. We see it time and time again, uh, and I think people, especially when you're starting out, to some aspect, want to take advantage of the fact that you are. You know, especially like, oh, we'll give you a bit of free exposure on Facebook if you go and do what was potentially a five thousand pound photo shoot. Right. <laughs> right. And you're it's like, a... great, cheers, cheers for the exposure on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> what am I gonna do with that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes there is a bit of give yeah. and take, but yeah, to your point, it is important not to undervalue your work. Mm-hmm. For yes. sure. Yes. Because there is a difference between doing it full time and paying your mortgage and paying your ins- work insurances and your bank accounts and all the rest of it and doing it as a hobby at the weekend where you can af- kind of afford to do it for next to nothing because you've got a day job Monday to Friday. And, and photographers of all kinds have different, they have different prerogatives, right? I'm trying to make a living doing this mm-hmm. and somebody else might be doing it for a hobby. So they might be trading for rods or for, um, for bows or for, arrows whatever they want to whatever the gear they they're looking to obtain and maybe some identity with the fly fishing and whatever industry they're trying to shoot for um you know they might have a prerogative of just doing that but i'm actually trying to pay the bills here at this house so um yeah it's it's been interesting and i've learned to be a better better salesman basically in in a way though if you do and it's i guess the mark in the last five six years maybe even slightly longer than that with digital cameras being more accessible at a beginner's level um as in you know you can pay four five hundred pounds you know six seven hundred dollars or whatever it is for a pretty good kit camera and lens you have these people that are uh, amateur photographers that can take a decent picture that are kind of uh, flooding the market and under like bringing the market price down because you're like, well, Jim down the road said he could do it for for a half pint. The, half the price that you could. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> you can you can tell a story with an iPhone. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? exactly. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't take equipment these days to do it, I and mean, we have amazing equipment at, the, at our fingertips now. And so part of it is just being there. And then another part of it is having the art of telling a story. Yeah. And that's, you know, it, that takes time. And, and I think the 10,000 hour rule is a big deal. I uh, still believe in that. Um, so people pay for your experience. That's also what they're paying for. They're not yes. 100% paying for you to click the lens. It's it's the months and years of of many hours of being in every situation, and every problem possible that's come up when a shoot's happening. Absolutely. That's what they're paying for. That is the big thing they're paying for. Is yeah. that you just got to convince the uh, <laughs> whatever company you're trying to get <laughs> yeah. paid by that they need to value that. Yeah, exactly. So, what was your first actual job as a like? What, what, what did you first get paid for as a photographer rather than rather than a guide? Ah, uh, Keen Footwear was the first person that hired me. Um, I was shooting footwear and I loved it. Uh, we did a backcountry shoot here in Montana in the Beartooth Wilderness, and we then that what snowballed into like uh, I did some like uh, I did some shoots for their industrial wear, and so went to some cool job sites. And my brother at the time was working in excavation, and, and uh, he's a great looking kid, and and he's very so put some boots on, yeah, yeah, put some boots on, man. Get back into that, get into that cat right now. And um, he did he modeled for me back in Illinois, and then um, I did some stuff here with a lineman, a friend of mine in Livingston. He climbed some telephone poles out in Livingston in some beautiful background you know like in the paradise valley basically where you guys drove drove to go to yellowstone we got up some of those telephone poles and took some great shots of him doing his job in industrial wear boots and that's kind of that was the beginning that was my first my first checks i would say i mean i got paid for a couple like i did i shot weddings i shot uh senior portraits i mean all sorts of stuff but the first one that i was like Okay, this is like working in the outdoor industry. Yeah, absolutely. It was keen footwear. And you must have done some pretty, or you must have achieved some pretty big highlights from then to now. Although it's actually, as we were saying, it's not a particularly long period of time. It's sort of like six years or something. I spent some time traveling with a good friend uh, in New Zealand. I was telling you about that uh, in 2013. I spent a winter over there pretty much and traveled around. I, I got to go. I went from the back country of New Zealand for a couple of weeks. Uh, shooting with him he's super great he's a great was that just for fun though 
Yeah, I was just trying to build a portfolio okay. of like international, outdoor. I can do this. Yes. And we brought a bunch of stuff from Patagonia and I was trying to build a portfolio to sell to them. I went to Australia after that. I went and then shot um, with Jono Shales of Exmouth Fly Fishing up in um, Exmouth, Western Australia. Uh, the first permit I ever saw was an Indo Pacific permit, which is a really big deal. Um, beautiful, beautiful fish. And. Anyways, I kind of started it's, it's off. It's in the middle of nowhere. I've been there. Yeah, you have been there. <laughs> yeah, I've, wow. I've been there. It's, I've met very really few in the middle people of nowhere. Been there. Yeah, it's wild, man. You got like kangaroos coming down the cool themselves, and yeah, the he, he hit one of them. <laughs> I can't. I hit one. <laughs> oh my gosh. And the ant hill and the ant hills that are oh, like two colossal, oh, absolutely colossal. And that red dirt. Oh, it's just you red. can't get out. I actually had to throw a bunch of my clothes away when I came when I went back to Perth, um, because that it's like a deep red orange. And you just can't get it out of anything. It just dies everything. Yeah, it's 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 a special place. I opened the bottom of my truck and like the air filters just like everything was just red. And and then I actually sold that vehicle as nearly new, never hit anything and I hit a kangaroo and an owl in it. <laughs> and an owl. Yeah. I didn't know that. Bang in the middle of the window. Like the windscreen. When, when driving at night. Yeah. It was scary. It was almost straight after the kangaroo. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Do you know what really, really pissed me off about that is that the week, the, <laughs> the week before I left, so I went, out, I was, I was dry, I drove from Perth, and we went. North. What? That's like sixteen hours. More than that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, we were just like, let's do a road trip, and so the, like two weeks before my mate arrived, I was like, right, I'm gonna have to get some spotlights on the front of my vehicle because of the kangaroo thing, and I knew we'd be driving through the night just to kind of make the distances because it was colossal distances. And uh, I wired it all up myself, and I was like, I've done such a good job. I had a little switch in my in the front of the the truck. I could turn my my spotlights on and off, and we must uh, and we were towing like um uh, one of those trailer things that you could turn into a tent, and we had like six seven extra jerry cans of fuel because all the fuel stations are closed. And uh, hit the kangaroo probably six hours into the journey of the night, and um, he decimated every spotlight that I'd uh, put on. I had oh. to, I, uh, I had some tape, and I taped it on, and there were one was pointing into the tree. That's probably why the <laughs> owl got disorientated <laughs> and crashed into the window. Um, but Jesus, uh, it was, it was, it was something else. Because I was just driving, doing my thing, and out of the corner of my eye, I just saw boing. And then the second Boeing was bang in the middle of the road. And, oh. I, and I hit him. And I had bull bars on my truck. Oh. And I hit him square in the middle. And he went down the side. And because I was towing a trailer, I didn't want to stop immediately. And I kind of looked down the road. And we were in the middle of nowhere. I looked down the road. I couldn't see him. I, I assume he maybe died. It, it was pitch black. There was nowhere I could go find him. And there's snakes and everything up there. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and I drive barefoot as well, so it's not exactly I'm going to wander off into the desert. And uh, I look at the front of my truck, and there's just fluid pouring out of the front. And I'm like, I am, I'm <laughs> screwed. I'm totally screwed here. And I start smelling it. I was like, oh my god, it's screen wash. And it was the only thing that it had broken oh, was no the way. screen wash bottle was tucked you right behind the bumper. Yeah, I was so lucky. But that was my kangaroo. But oh it's good God. up there. Exmouth is in the middle of nowhere, but it's nice up there. And from a fishery point of view, I mean, if, if anyone listening has been to the Keys, it would be like the equivalent it would be having Key Largo to Key West, both Oceanside and Backcountry to yourself. There's At the time, there was only two two outfitters there. Um, uh, one guy named, I believe, by the name of Brett, and then Jonah. And um, to have that much fishery to yourself... It's amazing. I was diving. That's yeah, why I was, it was up there. Amazing, yeah. The Ningaloo Reef, right? Yeah, yeah. I've Did dived. I've dived that whole reef. Yeah, that's amazing. And then I was um, Jim Clear. It's so pretty. Yeah, and the sharks migrate down yep. there. Yep, you got the whale sharks that yeah. come through there, and there's a lot of tiger sharks in there too. Yeah, I didn't see any of those. Uh, but when I was off Geraldton, though, which is further south, um, I was on some of the most spectacular reefs you've ever seen, and the fish. It was like um, it just. Imagine Blue Planet, and it was just to yourself. I that was bet. it on this roof, like coral trout and um, snapper and everything. It was an absolutely incredible, and it was all to ourselves. That's my bucket list to go back to that place. That, of any place I could fish in the world, I would go back to Exmouth to fish there. With Jonah, of course. He's the man. He's like the crocodile done to you. He's still there. Exmouth. Yeah, he's total badass. The real deal. Um, <laughs> Does he have a big knife? What's that? Does he have a big knife? Uh, yeah, no, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> He's got some badass skills, though. Um, the guy's a ninja. And 
I spent a winter over there kind of building a portfolio of images. I came home with them and that's kind of how I launched. That's how I started was kind of like kicking that out there. And to be honest with you, at the same time, I was also pushing on my guide business. And of course, I was trying to push on photography. It, photography for me really took off when I backed off of it and got exhausted by it for whatever reason. When you push on something so hard, sometimes you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. It was my first lesson of like, just kind of let it be what it would be. I backed off of it a little bit, and the email started being answered. It was weird. that I, I can't... I, where, where were you putting your, your photography, though? Where was it? Where was I pitching it? I was yeah. pitching it to everybody. I could possibly pitch it to every fly fishing company you could possibly think of. I was pitching it to. I was pitching a lot of it to Patagonia. At the time, I wanted to work for them. And... And then was, where, where did people find it once you kind of, I guess, took well, a little step back? Uh, Instagram, of course, it, yeah. at the time, yeah. was becoming a really popular thing. In 2013, it was starting to really take on. And so, you know, at the before that, you know, I had a website to start off with. Now, you don't even have a website anymore. You don't need that. You, have, you know, basically, Instagram's your portfolio. Yeah. And I just make sure I put high-quality photos on there. And also, post for the right reasons. I'm not posting for for quantity. I'm posting for quality. Like if you see my photo come up and I say something in it, I put some time thinking about it. You know what I mean? And I want to be known for that. Yeah. Um, and I guess I started being intentional about my posting on Instagram. And um, I also met some other people in the industry. I met uh, Ryan and Roy Cedars at Yeti when they were just getting going. And they're awesome guys. They gave me a crack and I got to work for them for a couple of years, which was amazing in the beginning. For Fantastic. sure. Yeah. And, um, and it just snowballed into, I, I told you about the conversation. I sat, in, sat down with Rick Wittenbaker from uh, Holler Brothers to have a beer with him. He was in Bozeman here. And I sit next to this guy, Brad Christian, you know, like some guy named Brad, whatever. Um, <laughs> hey, Brad, I'm Brad. Nice to meet you. What do you do? Oh, you work for Matthews. Cool. My buddies shoot Matthews. I shoot a Hoyt. Um, I shot one my whole life. Cool. You know, we go back and forth and we started talking. We follow each other on Instagram and we stayed in touch and... Um, I really, I really enjoyed Brad's creative brain. I mean, he mm -hmm. had some awesome ideas and he, he sent me a bow. I was a no cam at the time and I loved it. I really enjoyed shooting that Matthews and through his creative direction and what he wanted to do and his big ideas, I, I was, I was all in on it. And so that's really where I got my start with Matthews. I started shooting a Matthews bow and I started shooting photos for him. And when Brad transitioned over to Sika, I got my chance to work with Sika, which was has been awesome. Which is in town as well. Yeah. Because yep. all the good places seem to be in Bozeman. Yeah, Matthews is in Sparta, Wisconsin, but yeah, you got you got Sika right here in Bozeman and it's great. It's great to have the the team real close and just have them where we can go and have lunch if we need to talk about something face to face, like you're saying, the high quality aspect of having a face-to-face -face conversation is so makes a big difference oh man yeah. it's, it's a big deal absolutely well, I'm especially not, with building relationships i'm not sure if brad's uh podcast is going to actually come out before or after this one but while we're here we're hoping to do a podcast with brad as well oh that's great so that's gonna be yeah that's gonna be good we met him a few times before but not like properly had to had the chance to have a chat with him so right now's the chance yeah he, he's got some awesome ideas he's a big thinker um you'll enjoy his brain I know I have. We watched your film with him. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> when did that come out? That was, the, we launched on, uh, that was the launch day of Matthew's new flagship bow for 2019, um, The Verdicts. And we spent the summer and fall filming that project. Um, a lot it of looks hours. like a lot of work. There's yeah, a lot of footage is. in there. There's a lot of footage that we sh that that was shown in there, but there's a lot of footage that didn't make it. Like, and it always is the case, isn't it? I don't know how many hours we filmed, but man, <laughs> that, that is, is, what I liked about it is it kind of just it was like it just kept going. As in, like, do you feel like we we didn't sit on? Do you feel like it was too fast paced, or do you feel like you guys got a feel? I think of what it was, was going on? it was very unique in, in a way. It, it was a story told in a, in a way that I haven't really seen before. Um, but you know, I enjoyed it. I like, we we were discussing it as we were watching it, and yet the moments where it lulled, then you're having a conversation, and then it suddenly picked up again. Yeah. And there were also moments where you're kind of struggling to work out where's it going, but then you get fed enough that you stitch the pieces together. And I think that's what kept it intriguing. Uh, it was n one. It was nice editing, cut with some nice cinematography, with also some kind of raw. Uh, for, uh, cinematography in as well a bit more of a uh, 
No, well, it was just, just like candid like feel. Can, yeah. yeah. Yes, and that was what we were going for. Yeah. We used, uh, you know, Casey Neistat. I don't know. Uh, we used him to model off a lot of our. He watches YouTube. It's kind of crazy. This guy's in New York. He's kind of like, he's doing reviews on all sorts of different products. But he's got somewhat of a. He's got a great personality behind his lens. But um, it's a lot of self filming. It's a lot of like, kind of just raw camera out in front of you. Yeah selfie style yeah and um it's 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 kind of it's definitely become a thing and we kind of use that to base off of our our project with vertex so mm. you I, combined it though with a uh, high quality end production and some awesome footage and yeah I think that that, yeah a little bit of raw a little bit of professional yeah. yeah of course beautiful pretty shots and great light but also some just really raw stuff that you know you just you kinda, i love the phone bit at the end when you phone the guys at Matthews. Yeah, we were messing with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, something wrong with the boat. And then we got two bulls sitting on and top of And then you get the an truck. awesome reaction from them. I thought that was, that was cool. Because was that... Was, it's amazing. Was, was that legit? We, oh, were you actually messing with them? And you oh, absolutely. Yeah, we had to. You didn't I mean, plan otherwise, that. yeah, you're not going to get the can of no, reaction not, out no. of them. If we would told those guys, especially especially Derek, I think if we would have told him what would happen, he would have, I, I just, we wouldn't have got that reaction out of them. No way. And... um yeah, it was it was perfect timing. Uh, we we set that up. We spent <laughs> quite a bit of time beforehand planning that out to get them on the phone at the right time. Yeah, and to nail that down. So, and to have to have a dream hunt like that happen for the film was insane. You know, like it's a lot of pressure to go out there and say we got to you know produce for part of this bow being what it is 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 being productive during your hunting season. So to go on an elk hunt and hope to get one elk, let alone two. And I got a three fifty four six seven by eight bull that was the biggest bull of my life ever. And then to Brad the next day to shoot his biggest bull of his life. It was like mid three thirties, six by seven. You can't really plan that. bull. Absolutely. Those two were fighting the day I shot mine. Those two were below me, four hundred yards below me, fighting to the death. And uh I have no problem telling Brad that my, my bull ran his bull off. <laughs> <laughs> but but just for that to work out, and, and I remember the excitement of me um, killing my bull, a swift kill, and just pumped about what we did and how hard we've worked for that, and then for him to go out the next day. And I was just still packing my bull out. He went out on his own. He comes back um, and just – I remember he had – dirty socks because he was he was stalking in his socks that day and he had his socks in his hand he just walks up to the to camp and, and like just drops his socks like mike drop his socks and i'm like yeah and i just said i remember saying yeah and he goes yeah and i'm like no way man no way i'm still like my back is killing me from packing up that and now i'm gonna go and help you i'm gonna help you up. yeah um it was just a dream hunt to have without any cameras rolling and then to have that happen it was pretty special. Amazing. Well, people can check that out because it's online. Yeah. What's was, the name of it again? Um, Proving Grounds. Proving Grounds. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's on, on YouTube. It's yeah, it's on Matthew's stuff. piece. Yeah. That, that wasn't the elk we were eating tonight, was it? Uh, part of it, yeah. Really? Part, oh. part of it was Allie's. Part of it was mine. Bloody good. The, the, the tender pieces were Allie's. <laughs> <laughs> My bowl was a little It was older very nice was. food tonight. Yeah, uh, you liked it? Oh, that was outstanding, that's honestly. All, that's really all nice. Allie. She's a really good cook. She's phenomenal. She's phenomenal on all levels. I am so lucky to have her in my life. She let you dig a tunnel <laughs> underneath your house, so I think that says everything you need to know. Uh, the luckiest guy you guys have ever laid eyes on, I promise <laughs> you. Um, she's amazing. She's a great cook, and she loves to cook. She loves to host. And she hunts with you? Yeah. She loves to bow hunt. Did she hunt before? You guys got she together? Did. She did. Yep. She had hunted for two years prior to me meeting her, and she was just kind of getting into it. What I appreciate and love about hunting with Allie is that she's doing it for all the right reasons. She is so distracted by the littlest things when we go hunting. This year in particular, we were, we were, we had we bedded these elk in the morning. We didn't press on them. Uh, we backed off, coming back in the afternoon to go kind of get in position for the evening. We're walking up there, and I'm starting to see kind of cows starting to filter out of the bedding ground. And... I like I start to notice I'm walking by myself. I look back and she's crouched over this ant pile and they had just killed a grasshopper and they were dissecting this thing like I've never seen it. And I would have never stopped to look at this. Even if I saw the grasshopper there and doing what they were doing, I would have been focused on the elk. And she's like, we got to like take a second to look, watch this. 
Like I just, I've been watching this for like two minutes while you've been walking ahead. I walk back a hundred yards and I'm like, what are you doing? Like they're starting to come out. She's like, look at what's going on here. And I watch these ants just devour this grasshopper and dissect this thing. And I loved that. I love that she takes the time to look at the little things in, in, in nature instead of trying to, you know, my end goal is like, that's, that's get your first elk. And she's thinking, I'm going to enjoy every aspect of this, this time together out in the mountains, hunting, Montana, whatever, spending time with me, whatever it is. But the fact that she like that stopped her world that day, like that's just one of many stories I have with Allie. And when we go hunting together, is she, is she from here? Um, she's not, she's from the Midwest. She's from Cincinnati. She thought she, the day she killed her elk that evening, um, prior to that, we were taking a midday break and there was two ladybugs sitting on one of her arrows and they were mating. And she's like, man, I don't know if that's lucky. I don't know what <laughs> lucky is. Like, I'm, t- today's my day. Today's my day. Two mating ladybugs on that arrow. I'm using that arrow and tonight's the night. And sure as shit, it went down that evening. But like, that's the enthusiasm that I love behind her. She's got such a, a fire for life in that way. It's those little things that make the experience more. Absolutely. Absolutely. A- and I think a lot of people can learn from that story to just slow down a little bit. Yes. Because it is not all about the end result. And this is kind of like the this is the journey of life that we were talking about at the very start. Yes. The journey getting to the end result is important as well. Yes. So pre- I mean, we've had conversations like this. When we've been hunting together. We even put it in one of the films that we were making. What was the with the wood ants nest? Yeah, we don't have many wood ants in Lost Nest yeah. um, in Scotland. So it's pretty awesome watching them. And I've always had a fascination for ants as well, which helps. Like a weird fascination. You and Ali could talk for hours about this. <laughs> the only, the only, the. Like when we first moved in together, she wanted an ant farm. That's what we ended up. She buying. wanted it. We, I have one on my office desk, dude. You and Allie. <laughs> yeah, don't like don't mention that. Like, to her see tonight. all sorts you won't of leave this house. Ants. Uh, like, honestly, I've had when I was growing up, I had three tanks in my bedroom full of different types of ants and colonies because I like to see how they built stuff. And uh, then, That's yeah, awesome. as an adult now, I can do what I want, so I can have an ant nest on my. But but he's missed out a bit here because. He did this as a kid, and he got so into it, and he built himself a little website. This and is like 12 years old. 12 years old. And then Channel 4, which is, at the time, there was only five, five, five channels, channels at the time. Channel 4, so a fairly major channel. Find this website, think it's like some <laughs> ant expert, and get hires him to go and wrangle ants. In London. In London <laughs> for a wildlife documentary. In a, in a studio, it was a physics show. <laughs> He's like, you had to bring my dad with because he was like, wasn't old enough to fly. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And, and they were like, oh, um, can you bring your ants down? And then uh, <laughs> actually we're going to ship some ants from Germany for you to look after. And they sent the biggest fucking ant you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> I was 12 years old. Bear in mind, like, I'd seen some African ants and these were the closest things to it. And I was like, how am I going to tame these ants? At tw- <laughs> I was like doing little experiments at the house, like trying to keep them in, in like an enclosure, like an invisible enclosure, trying to figure out how to stop them crossing this boundary. Because I used, basically the idea the studio has where they'd have like six panes of glass all suspended on top of each other with different layers would have ants running across them and then they would film straight from the bottom looking up through all of the panes so that you'd have ants crossing over each other so it would look really cool but obviously I there was no way to like fence them off so I had to kind of make a barrier around it and I found that the ants didn't really like shaving foam um, because of the mint smell and so that was kind of this barrier that just How did you figure that out? A lot of experimenting. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Did you just walk through the convenience store or like the grocery store and grab all sorts of like deodorants and ivory soaps? I did did, did a bit of research. (laughs) Uh, There was a book I had, an ant book and it mentioned that they might not like mint. So I was like, what's got mint in it that's easy to... Like, and at 12 years old, obviously, his shaving foam. Shaving foam. <laughs> I was, I was like, really? I, I was maturing really? young. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, so I had these ants, and um, I went down to London, and it was all... It was it, it went well, and um, <laughs> I put on the UK ants uh, that I had. I, I, I brought two species with me, and I had just basically the common black ant, put that on, they're all chilled, that's fine. Now it's time for the German ants to go on, and, and these were guys were like something from the third, Reich <laughs> German army <laughs> these these guys I because I'd only got them like two days before we flew down so I hadn't managed to do the shaving experiment. 
<laughs> these guys march through the shaving foam like a panzer division <laughs> during <laughs> during the invasion of Europe. And the poor bastard cameraman underneath was lying there and they were going down his shirt <laughs> and biting him. Oh, I've never seen someone squirm so much. Oh my god. And they were probably thinking, this is what happens when you hire a twelve year old. <laughs> I completely forgot I did that. <laughs> so that was my start of my filming career when I was, was twelve years when I was twelve years old wrangling hands. We'd, oh I'd forgotten God. about that when you know, people ask you, you know, how did it start? Yeah. It actually started at twelve for uh, Daryl. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've got the DVD somewhere, and it worked. You know, it, the end result, it, it, it was, was pretty. Cool. It was about two seconds of footage on the channel, and it actually worked. It really did work. So there we go. <laughs> Oh, but that's but a little but that cameraman never didn't want to work with ants again. Or kids. <laughs> or kids. I think they gave me like a 50 quid voucher for Virgin <laughs> mega, mega Stores, which doesn't even exist anymore. I was just thinking, uh, when you were telling the story about watching the, the grasshopper being sort of dismembered, is what an awesome parallel. There you are, the giant, standing there trying to hunt an elk, and then at your feet, there's another hunt going on. Absolutely. Underneath the canopy. Absolutely. And there, if you think hard enough and you look deep enough, there's those parallels going on everywhere. Yeah. And we are, at that level, as the hunter, we're the same as the ant. We're Absolutely. the same as everything that's there when we're part of that environment. Absolutely. And, and that's so cool. It's as holistic as it can possibly feel, right, to watch that stuff and to be a part of it. And you just, I love, the, but hunting with Allie, is that, that's the aspect I get with when I hunt with her. So I'm I'm really lucky to have it. It's not like I'm tagging along my fiance like come hunting with me, you know, come bow hunting. This is what I like to do, so come with me. She truly enjoys to do it, and she also brings something different that I'd never really appreciated until I I met her. And so, hunting to her and I is pretty special. It's not. It's there's a lot of aspects that are important to both of us on it. But how'd you meet? That quality time. <laughs> that's that's a funny long story. <laughs> is it podcastable? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, you know, Allie, um, she worked for the Museum of the Rockies at the time. She was dating another guy in town. He works in the hunting industry, so that's probably the pod- that's the interesting podcast okay, part. Okay. Um, no names mentioned, but they were dating at the time. Um, of course, she's a smart, intriguing, intelligent, beautiful, charming charismatic I mean, you're going to have to get us to listen back to this podcast to when, like you're, when, you're in, when you're in trouble one day fiance. I love, really love she's going to have to listen to this podcast uh, when, when we're recording no, it's like no. two, two days shy of Valentine's Day and it, it won't be out in time but you could just be like this is your Valentine's present look at all the good things I'm saying about you <laughs> well their relationship didn't work out and, and I'm not going to waste any time So it, and I didn't and I probably have a, a reputation in town for not wasting much time on that and I'm okay with that because I, I you don't care I'm I'm the luckiest man alive. Absolutely, it was totally worth it. But I met her um, just by being in the right place at the right time and being observant enough to see someone special. And there she is. You need to top up with water. Ah, I'm I've good. been I've been giving I'm sign good. language to Tyler to rehydrate <laughs> me after all that laughing. So, what do you guys like? What's your what's your what's your first impression of Montana when you got here? What do you, what do you find about this place that that you're digging on that that's different. It's uh, for me, uh, it, it, like I guess best way to describe it's it's open and there's not a lot there's not a lot of people here which no. I like. Yeah, it's kind of like you look. There might be one or two dotted houses, and it's just mountain. Right. And and there's nothing here. Right. Other than the but landscape, everything. but everything here. <laughs> right. And you don't really see that too often nowadays. Yeah, and we've done. Do you feel? I think we've done a good job of, as as a society, as as Americans, um, keeping things where they need, like um, national forest being national forest, and not putting houses all over the mountain, and like keeping them in the lowlands, so keeping important, them spaced that. out, and so kind of, important. Yeah, yeah, and and not, it, it it's not overzealous. It's not uh, greedy. I don't. It doesn't look greedy here. You know, in Montana especially. Um, it, the way I think they had a lot of forethought going forward, like back when they were developing some of these lowlands and like the bottom hills of the Bridger Range, mm. they had a lot of forethought. Like 
let's make let's make covenants where you have to own 10 acres or five acres or you can't have the house here or there like we've done a good job of spacing things out i feel like yeah here in Montana. I, i've been very you know i've we have not been here all that long but i've been very impressed and i always think it's it's a little bit like uh you know never meet your heroes because you might be disappointed right it's a dangerous thing going to a place that you've held really close to you for whatever reason through for me it's through reading and, and a lot of my sort of hunting conservation heroes a lot of them just disseminated from north america and montana has always been a big part of that story uh, new zealand was another one for me which and i've talked about this <clears throat> with the guys who i was in new zealand with at the time it kind of awesome place great people but i was left kind of it was an element of me that was left disappointed by the experience because of the way one of the big aspects of it was because of the way that they treated their wildlife and they just everything's basically a pest there and there are some great people there who want to change that but that is not the overall mentality and i felt i was really gutted by that because i'd held it as the it one of my escape places like if everything turned to shit in scotland and for it, the society and the way that i like to live my life wasn't possible anymore maybe i would go there but i came away thinking it could just be be so much better and disappointed whereas in the limited time i've been here i'm thinking to myself thank goodness it is it is everything i hoped it would be and more oh that's great and that's for me that's that's but awesome. we would have to marry an american to get yeah it. yeah we, we could find <laughs> you one of those <laughs> There's plenty of women around Bozeman now. Huh? When I moved here in 2000, and but I, tell you that. I, I would have to be um, Mormon though, because I'm already married, so I, I need another wife. Well, I, yeah, believe me, the last time I checked, it's illegal in this in, in this country. Uh, so, but <laughs> I'm not married, but I think Beth would kill me. <laughs> Tyler would testify. <laughs> so no, yeah. To answer your question, you know, I think from what we've all expectations seen, met. Fan, yeah, Great. and I've every day I'm just enjoying learning more, meeting new people, understanding the place better. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely not going to be the last time I visit here. The, the Whether Tyler can put up with us again, I don't know. But The, the one thing I would say is that uh, I've spoken to many people before we came here about America because it was the first time we've come to the United States. And everyone that I've spoken to said everyone's so friendly. And it is a hundred percent true. Every person that uh, we—that's just Montana. <laughs> well, even in Seattle, you know, Seattle I, I hear. Well. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm biased, you know. Uh, <laughs> honestly, everyone has been very, very that's friendly. Good. Yeah. Good. Like, yeah. I, I, I'm. The, well, the, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. You know, as a, as a U.S. citizen, and hopefully you guys are treated fairly, and you should be, and people should be outgoing and, and generous. Um, well, that's great to hear that. I'm proud of that. Um, you're not gonna, you're gonna feel that way the whole time you spend here in Montana because this is exactly well, what we all live here for. Daryl's going to photograph a bison hunt tomorrow. That's gonna be. I mean, that's gonna be an that's gonna be an experience for the bucket list. That's gonna be an experience. Uh, been a few years since I've been in the saddle. Are you gonna pressure him to shoot the first bison that comes in? I don't. That, that comes down, through, or it's down to them. I, I've been on hunts before where no trigger's been pulled for three, four days, and it doesn't bother me. Yeah, I I'm, he's documenting. I'm an ob I'm an observer. So they've been hunting for a while now. They've been hunting. No, no, they literally went out today for the first time. Oh wow! Um, just to scout. Oh, well, I think he'd had friends. The guy that we're going with, he had friends, sort of keeping an eye out. So tomorrow's that you know actually bringing a firearm and yeah, ready, they're going out on horseback. Yeah, I'm doing it. So I'm sure we're we're going to probably do a podcast on it once Daryl's had his experience. So that should be good. But just to go back on, because um, we kind of we skipped ahead to your hunt with Brad, but prior to that we were talking about all the fishing you'd done, but not really a lot about your hunting. How did your where did the hunting sort of come back into importance from you? Cause it's all, it's always been a part of my life here in Montana. Uh, so you've always been doing it in, yeah, in amongst the fishing. After the first year of college, I started bow hunting here in Montana. And I remember the first time I went up, I went to the base of Bridger Bull. That's our local ski mountain leases from the National Forest, uh, the property to ski on. So they have a season and it ends. But in the fall time, before the season begins, it's just National Forest. Well, I'd park in the parking lot and I'd walk catwalks up the mountain. And I remember the first time, like, it, it, getting up there, I was alone. I couldn't find anyone that wanted to go bow hunting with me. And parts in the dark, I'm in the Rocky Mountains. The way I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I'm in the middle of the Rockies. There's bears, there's cats, there's whatever, there's wolves. There's 
I mean, at the time, growing up in the Midwest, coyotes are like, you know, people are like, oh, there's a lot of coyotes in that part of, you know, that part. You're like, there's freaking bears here. (laughs) Yeah, there's bears here. Black bears, grizzly bears, it didn't matter. It was a bear. And I remember being in the truck and like, okay, you know, I should get out and start hiking now. It's about 45 minutes before light. I remember getting out of the truck and taking like 10 steps. And I was like, "Mm, I think I'll sit back in the truck until it gets light out. (laughs) And I went back and sat in the truck until it got light out. Mind games. Yeah, total, total mind game. And just learning how to hunt alone, you know. Like that's there's a dynamic to that, um, and to this very day I've gotten really comfortable with it. Now I prefer to hunt alone, and but going for six days in the mountains here in Montana, I feel very safe doing it now. But there was a time frame where it was very uncomfortable to go out and do that, and I've had an evolution of myself hunting here, and I've really learned how to hunt, um, and I've learned a lot about myself through that process here in being Montana. Being alone, yeah, being alone. You do, yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. A lot of time for your own thoughts to yeah, take talk, hold. Talk to myself. Doubt and have, optimism. Oh, yeah. It's just, all it's, of it. Yeah, absolutely. You get everything out when you're out hunting alone. You really learn a lot about yourself. How independent are you? Go hunting by yourself in Montana. <laughs> yeah. we, we're going to at some point next yeah. time, next yeah, trip. Absolutely. Just after the fishing. You've told us September's a good month to come. It, it'd be a great time frame to be here. You could do some elk hunting. You could do some great dry fly fishing. Grasshopper season's killing it that month i mean it's it's great i'll get my grasshopper patterns tied up yeah man you don't have to show up with anything but sunglasses you you know i'll come pick you up in town we'll just go fishing i got everything and a pair of boxes maybe yeah you should probably wear some underwear (laughs) (laughs) i don't know how you guys do it in scotland (laughs) just just kilts Uh, you know what this year was just was just wetsuit boots and shorts and we just waited oh right on that's the first year in years we've been able to do that because the the river was so hot oh wow it wasn't very good for fishing because no. of that, but yeah, <laughs> it's good for swimming. Yeah, th- you know these fish get lethargic in hot water too. We get seventy degree temperatures here. We have actually have closures on the river um, for water temperature. Yeah, they'll hey, close after two o'clock in the afternoon. You can't fish after two o'clock. See, we Call. should have done that this year in Scotland. It's not something that existed. Eventually, there became a sort of a a general consensus. Like we stopped fishing for trout, and a general consensus that maybe people shouldn't be, um, but. It's not something that has ever really been discussed in terms of we should lay down a, an actual defined above a temperature. There should be no one in the river. And I think after this summer, if we have another one like that, it's then something we should probably should discuss. If the water temperature breaks over 70 degrees for three consecutive days, they'll put hood owl restrictions on there. After 2 o'clock, you cannot fish. And if it stays that way, they'll stop it at noon regardless you shouldn't be pretty much to give up fishing for trout after 70 degrees yeah. i mean because anything you put back is got yeah a real slim chance yeah abso- absolutely absolutely they're toast i mean it's, it's and then working as a fly fishing outfitter and having these guys come in and you know they book their trips months in advance my july and august is booked solid now at yeah. this point if they don't book by january 1 it's it, those dates are gone that's prime time and so they show up and to go fishing and, and like you do what you can for them. Um, we end up going to a lot of lakes around here, and which is not as desirable as the beautiful, pristine Yellowstone. But it's River. your backup plan. But them. it's a backup plan, and and I take or we'll go into the mountains. I'll find someone with national forest permits, and we'll go walk way in the mountains uh, where there's colder water, but basically shop for colder colder water. Yeah. For that particular purpose, hmm. it's funny how you become sentimental about something um, in the beginning of guiding as as well hunting. Um, I was all about like productivity right like well, was, getting your clients yes yeah, well in the money yeah, catching trout like all i care like we needed we caught 30 we need 40 we caught 40 we need 50 now i'm all about like just high productivity as far as like how can i get them to just enjoy their day you know and that might be at five fish that might be at 10 fish and if they catch more than 15 i really don't give a shit if they catch another one yeah because that's plenty <laughs> um uh, 15 fish is enough for any man you, yeah yeah it wins enough enough yeah. you know and and just I just become more sentimental about them. You know, everything, Every look around this room right now. It's because trout swam for my life here in Montana. I mean, I've paid for this stuff with trout fishing more than I have with photography. That's relatively new development. But, I like, it's a really sentimental piece of Montana. You, you were saying earlier about the, the guiding, how it's quite a process in Montana. How many years would you have to do to be considered a guide here? Well, you can have an outfitter sign your license as a guide. Like, it's an outfitter. I'm an outfitter. I can sign you guys as a, as a guide. You just can't solicit yourself. 
Uh, there are no business cards that can solicit to your own, and you couldn't book your own clients. Okay. Uh, the clients have, would be booked through the outfitter. They'd have to be booked through me, yeah. yeah. They'd have to be filtered through the outfitter. Yep. That's good. And highly regulated. Um, we're checked almost daily now at this point on really? these rivers. Yeah. They'll be out, uh, we'll be game wardens at just at the heavier, heavier out, um, I'm sorry, the, the more, the, the busiest mm-hmm. put ins and takeouts. Hmm. And um, they'll be checking to make sure that you have all your, all your license and all your ducks in a row, and I'm glad for it. Um, it needs to be regulated. There's a lot of pressure that happens here in Montana. It's different now than it was 10 years ago, and it just needs to be. It needs the regulation. Is it is the pressure being managed so that there isn't uh, negative effects on it? Is there a reasonable balance? It's always hard when there's a commercial aspect to anything. Yeah. To, to I think we're tips just, that balance correctly. It's just the dance right now. You yeah. know, we're just trying to figure out where the sweet spot is. But there's a high demand in fly fishing. I mean, it's become a really popular thing. And I'm glad for it, man. It's, I mean, more people out fishing, more yeah. people can care about it, more people can protect the resource. And that's the key. Yep. It gives a reason, it gives people a reason to care about something. Yes. I think, I remember, I think Will Primo said it, and it was stuck in my head as Will Primo saying it, but you have to, you have to teach someone to love something before they can protect it or feel like they can, you know, try to do their, do their part to preserve it. Yeah. And if people come out here and they fall in love with fly fishing, they have a better reason to protect it. So I'm all about people coming out here and fishing. It's just, it needs to be regulated more than it has been in the past. It's very difficult for people to have buy-in to a species or an environment if they remain detached from it, from someone in a city to be really concerned about a particular stream or a particular species that they've never laid eyes on sure. or never stepped foot in. Sure. And I think that's one of the things that makes what we would call them countryside pursuits and but by that i mean all encompassing whether it's somebody who likes riding trails on a, on a bike or whether it's someone who likes kayaking the river or fishing or hunting they're out there and they're seeing it and they're smelling it and they're feeling it and so their connection to that place is far greater than somebody who's sitting in a, in town that might maybe watch a film about yellowstone right you're right. That that surrounds a lot of the controversy of today, right? I mean, um, in particular, the wolves of Montana have become an issue, right? Well, they're as an emotive as, issue. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the 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 wolf seasons that we have now. I mean, it's different for a rancher in Montana to have a perspective on wolves compared to somebody in New York City that's only watched National Geographic his whole life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so there's two different perspectives. And of course, I just went from the left to the far right on both of those things. But there's all that in the middle that still creates this controversy. And I think I'm going along the lines of what you just said about you have to take people and put them in, the, in that. They have to taste it. They have to smell it. They have to touch it to understand it. And it becomes quite the controversy here with private interests and public resource. It becomes quite the issue here. Yeah. And public resource in in North America, I know, is something you guys are talking about a huge amount with your public lands debate. And Have you guys learned about our public lands and landlocked land in Montana? We know, and, and I know a little bit about it. Yeah. We really, uh, we really should dedicate a whole podcast to it to yeah, to really sort of thrash it out. Um, but we've spoken to a few people about it periodically, like over the last twelve yeah. months, just to try and help people in other parts of the world listen to our podcast, understand what, what's going on here because it is so, it is so different. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic here. I mean, what's what's your take on on your future of public lands and your concern of it, where you're going or where it's potentially headed? Well, I I think there's this national outcry for public land access right now, especially with landlocked public land, and protecting some of our national forests and national parks. And I absolutely agree with those, but people crying about public land like crying out for public not crying about crying out for public land and access is one thing but like if you were to actually see some of this land that's not being holistically rotated for grazing purposes you'd understand that regardless of whether you had access or not you wouldn't want to hunt or fish or recreate on it anyways because it's not being treated properly and i know that because i spent a lot of time trying to access some of the, the public land that's harder to access. Um, whether that's through land, knocking on doors and asking a landowner if I can 
go through his land to access public land that's inside of his land or um paid trespassing fees to go across before i mean i've done all sorts of stuff to try to get to try to get into less pressured hunting or less pressured fishing both yeah. and when you get in there and you realize this land is beat to a pulp and it's like a putting green in here because they haven't moved their cattle off at all summer and right on the other side of the fence is private land that's thick as it gets and you couldn't take three steps without tripping on this grass you start to understand like how things are so just it's not ab- black and white. Just abused, yes, yes. Where I think a lot, it's not black and white. There's a lot of different layers to it. Um, so there's no point in having access to land if it's being destroyed. You can't use it. <laughs> if it's being destroyed, absolutely. If it's just being degraded to the point of there's nothing that wants to be there anyway. So of course there's no there's no game there if you did want to go there because it's just been over it's been over abused. Think about when you rent a car. I mean it's it's <laughs> don't you don't want to buy a rental dude, car off. Do, do you drive a rental car like you drive your personal vehicle no, in a the, snowstorm? No, the, you the don't. fastest cars in the world. <laughs> <laughs> drive it like you borrowed it, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah, yeah it, it's like I'm not saying that all ranchers are beating public lands that they've leased to a pulp. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that it happens. As a human being, how do you treat things that you don't own compared to the things that you lease or rent or borrow? Mm. I mean, it, it's a different it's a it's a different dynamic, right? I think on a I I think there's <laughs> you can go a lot of ways with this conversation <laughs> on that, but in my experience, um, being on some of this public land here in Montana, it's not so much a cry for access to this land. It's more about how do we manage all of it together to better. make it better, yeah, more yeah. holistically, so that animals do want to be on, it doesn't matter if it's private or public, that they want to be in that environment anyways. There's a lot of things that happen here that aren't talked about. Yeah, and those kind of dis- discussions are just, they're so important to happen in in all aspects, whether it be public land or the way uh, the way organizations, uh, like hunting, fishing organizations behave or act, or things they are doing, things they aren't doing, the whole spectrum of things, or individual people, or the way companies portray hunting, all of these things are discussions which we shouldn't be uncomfortable about having because ultimately, if we have them, we can hopefully come to a better conclusion and outcome at Absolutely. the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, it's. For people at home uh, in the UK, and I wrote about this in um, in Modern Huntsman in Volume Two, is that we don't have the public lands that you guys have, and there's so much, there's so many great aspects of being able to publicly access land to be able to hunt and fish on. But we have a vast majority of private land ownership in Scotland, but public access everywhere for walking, hiking, camping. Um, there's quite a lot of public fishing. There's some a very small amount of uh, public hunting, but largely speaking, you can go where you like. But the private ownership of the hunting rights actually works really well. And you don't have poaching problems. I mean, if no. you, have, you have the you said you have the right to roam, right? Yeah. So say you walk in eight miles deep into some forest and you shoot a stag back there, and it doesn't really happen. Yes, there's poaching. There obviously. is poaching. There sure. is poaching, but not probably quite like you're thinking and a lot of that will be to do because of our gun ownership laws okay yeah. um because the, the you can't just wander around with a gun so you can have access to that ground but no you can't carry firearms on it okay so that's the immediate well hang on a second yeah i know you're hiking why have you got so a rifle stuck on your shoulder yeah um but anybody doing that you can question unless they've you know unless they've got a right to be there but the private land ownership that we have there, largely speaking, it's not perfect, but largely speaking, works really well. We're a much, we're a very small island, so it's it's not necessarily comparable. But the idea that all private land ownership's bad is a distorted view. It's a little bit like one's far to the one side, one's far to the other, and there's normally some somewhere in the middle, like you were saying. And I'm all about private land ownership. I, I I'm a private land owner. We're sitting on 20 acres right here, like. I'm all about that. I, it's 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 how do we find a balance of what do we do with this land that's locked up in the middle of that we that knowing that we're paying taxes on it's BLM land it's state land. I understand its purpose at the time it was created, but now what do we do with it now? You know, and is is that land trades? Do we do that? Do we do land trades and try to consolidate this stuff into bigger chunks, or? sell it off outright um you know it's been 
that's been a topic in the last couple of years with our new president. Um, what what do we do with this stuff, and how do we allocate it? How do we how do we how do we preserve it? I don't well, know. Like I don't. I just don't even know how what what steps we take. And I know there's a lot of talk about it, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately, and I'm just I don't I don't see the there's no clear answer right now, of mm-hmm. course. But I'm just like you know something we need to take into more time. Tyler's sitting in the room having listened to the, to, to the podcast, but he's not in it. But I'm sure it's something that you're going to cover at some point, in Modern Huntsman. He is nodding his head. It's going Do you to be have covered. an answer yet, buddy? No. Nah. He's shaking his head. <laughs> yeah. From that to um, probably something as we'll start to draw this podcast to a close, but during the period of time that you've been involved as a photographer and the extended period of time that you have yourself been a hunter, how have you seen hunting here in North America change for the better or worse? Do you feel like we're moving now into a, a more positive direction for the the future of hunting, so that we can, so that people will still be able to do it? I know that we feel at home, and I'm sure this this is true in most countries that the general consensus in terms of the 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 ooh, nearly dropping my water on my laps there that was close. <laughs> the general consensus across the, the public who don't do, do who don't hunt who don't fish is not necessarily all that positive. I think it's maybe less so in the States because you have a much more sort of sympathetic population, but we feel it a, a, a lot at home. And, you know, if you were to ask me, will we still be able to hunt at all in a 100 years? I don't honestly know if I could tell you the answer would be yes at home. And I can't tell you that answer here in Montana either. I, Allie and I talk about that as we talk about having children. You know, are we going to be able to take our, our kids on an elk hunt here in Montana? without having to spend thousands of dollars to go on a quality hunt enough to where they experience you know, bugling bulls in September. I think I think time will tell. I, I, I honestly cannot see the, I can see the near future of it um, continuing to be progressive as far as we're going to do. There's, there's obviously amazing conservation that's being being done and allocating tags and and also the research of how many animals can be um, taken out of a specific area. We've done a great job of that. I feel like we've had we have more elk now historically yeah. than through we've your ever sustainable had. harvesting system. Absolutely, yeah. and I feel like that's going to become strong. But uh, are they going to be where we can access them, or is there going to be so much pressure that they're not going to be there? I don't know. But do you think that there there is a potential for a, a shift in society where? Hunting is seen as something which shouldn't happen anymore. Yeah, I think that. I mean, I hate to sound pessimistic about it, but I feel like it's. It's very difficult I for people to explain it. I think it's getting more polarized than it's ever been. Yes. Yeah, that's probably fair. I think we're getting further away from the reality, or like our historical innate being as humans to go out there and harvest for ourselves. And there's a good argument on the earth side. We talked about this earlier. We're not hunting for sustenance anymore. Now we now we bring in the word sport, you know, or that we want to be in intact with nature, or we want to gain, yeah, we want to hunt for our own meat. But do we need to go hunt? Do we have to to feed ourselves? I don't think so. I don't know. Um, I, there's a good argument on both sides. I've heard both of them, and I can't tell you the answer. It's, I mean, it is the great challenge we face. The, the great challenge we face is trying to decide ourselves first probably how hunting fits into the greater landscape and where do the benefits of hunting lie and i i think that one of the the major discussions that is is happening is beginning to happen and we should continue to have is that we are all very concerned about our environment. Well, we're not all very concerned about it but we should all be very concerned about our greater environmental impact whether that be driving your car or whether that be how you actually source your food. And I think hunting as part of that greater envi- being conscious of the environment is going to play and should play a major role because it is a way to utilize the planet and the resources that we have in a sustainable way for the betterment of the environment and the species that are in it. And I think that bringing that conversation back to an environmental, environmentally responsible um, discussion 
is probably going to carry quite a lot of weight. And, and to some extent, that in, in that discussion, it's not just about meat. That is a byproduct of managing a landscape. Do you think we're getting? We're obviously getting further and further away from its natural flow, its ebbs and flows. Of, of humans have done a pretty good job of screwing that up. Yeah, yeah. So naturally, as future goes, I mean, as our population continues to increase and we control more and more of what we consider the natural environment mm. around us, you're saying that hunting is going to be part of that holistic picture of what we have to make to keep things in balance and it should be considered part of that balance yeah i mean that's you know i struggle with it all the time i'm trying to decide where where it fits and where our responsibilities lie just as human beings forget being a hunter yeah but but as human beings what what's what's going to be important and i think it's important that we don't degrade the planet the habitat and the species that we have any further than we already have yes. there's been some fantastic success stories particularly here in north america you you, know, you guys have some some of the best um recoveries of species over the last you know, 100 120 years and that's something that should never be forgotten uh and we should definitely be working forward into the future to make sure that we never go back there uh but hunting i think is going to play a very important role in helping to provide that balance of environmental responsibility. Because ultimately, as you've just pointed out, humans have screwed up the balance of the planet because of the way that we use resources and the way that we put up fences and the migratory patterns aren't what they used to be. We put the, 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 best, the best way to look at it is that if we disappeared tomorrow, everything else would just carry on the way it was. It would eventually go back. Though. It would go back it to the way it was. Sure. But if we accept that we also have a place on the planet, which we do. Which we, we do because we're, we're here. <laughs> we are part of it. There's maybe too much of us, many people would argue. Then we have to be prepared to get our hands dirty and manage that landscape to the best of our ability and hopefully to the extent that it's not just sustainable but that we see improvements in it. Buddy, that sounds like... <laughs> that sounds. I like, hope, anyway. I, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It just, you know, organizing 6 billion people to think that way and to, to think of our, our, our world and our, our environments here. But what do you think we as hunters can do to try and tell that story better? Because I think a lot of us, you know, particularly, th you know, this drive to have these not kind of discussions. Not tell it to each other. Not tell it to each other. Yeah. Tell it to people that don't see it like we see it. Mm. I mean, that should be the number one goal, I would think. Uh, and it comes down to everything from, you know, stop consuming so much plastic. When you go to the grocery store, you know, we, we are today we are at the grocery store and Allie's got me into a good habit of we take cardboard boxes. They got a huge pile of boxes, right? And plastic bags are so convenient. They're right there, but they're plastic. I mean, it's just, you start to have this guilt trip, right? Of God, how much, how many plastic bags do I consume a year bringing home my groceries? So it's like go get a go get a cardboard box, fill your groceries there, bring it home, take the cardboard box, put it in the recyclery, take that back to the cardboard recycling bin, and try to feel like you're creating some kind of balance. I'm not patting myself little on the steps. shoulder with this, little, but little steps. steps, things that you can do personally, and also, like that was an impact that's kind of been taught to me. Like that that was I never had that really. That wasn't really a part of my thought process until it was shown to me. And now that I've been shown it, I'm like, yeah, that totally makes sense, and I feel responsible doing that. It's like teaching more people to do little things like that, things that they can control, but not like you can't save the world by yourself, you know, but you can do this, you can do that, you can do this thing to make it a better place and to, to try to make an impact. You, do you, do you guys charge for plastic bags here? No, that would be a great idea. So in okay. Scotland, it's law. So every shop has to charge for a plastic bag. It's now 10p of a bag. Some of them don't even sell reusable plastic bag. Not really usable. The one-off plastic bags anymore. So like the big shops. Brilliant. They you should be like 10 bucks a bag here. Yeah, you yeah, buy a Hessian bag. You have to buy a Hessian bag or something from the shop. Or, or come with your own. Or, yeah, yeah. And that, that's cool. That's great. Um, and the consumption of bags has been... Uh, there's, some, there's some crazy stat in the UK across the whole of the United Kingdom of our bag usage is is. Is unbelievably low now, and now what the stores are doing, which is even better, I saw it for the first time the other day. You can go in, and they're all compostable bags, so you can just throw it into the, your food waste, and it'll just degrade into the ground. That's what they've done, uh, and that's come from a government level. 
And they've just said, all right, enough is enough. Plastic bags, we're killing the ocean. Let's just do something about it. We'll charge it. And everyone was like, hang on a minute. Maybe I don't need 10 plastic bags when I'm shopping. Every time I shop. Every time I shop. Because yeah. <laughs> it, it was. We, we, all, we all did it. It was a really quick change. It was a and quick change overnight. It actually made me feel pretty stupid. Yeah. Because I thought to myself, what, what, what the hell have I been doing? Why have I been buying plastic bags for the last 10 years? Well, no, you didn't buy them. You just... You, you do you want a plastic bag? Yeah, yes. put it in a plastic bag for me. Right. It's just laziness. Yes. You know, pack a couple of reusable bags, you know, the big heavy-duty things, yes. in your or a cardboard box. Yes. Or, or the reusable bags are better because they don't take up a space in your car. You just stick them onto your seat. And then you just take them in the store with you. Job done. Or the, or the cardboard boxes. So a lot of our stores will m- maybe like be some of yours where you can walk in the store and they've got all the boxes piled up and you can just take one as soon as you walk in. Yeah, it's exactly plastic straws. That's another thing that's gone. Yep, yep. Have you guys done that too? No, I've been seeing more and more bamboo straws around. But so metal, metal, and bamboo Um, straws are a big thing. And then I don't know if you guys have banned it here. You know, um, microbeads. Like you know, face face scrubs. You know, any scrub that's got like you look like a man who scrubs your face. Oh, every single (laughs) second. (laughs) So you you know, um, like shower gels. I've got like the the grit in them and that. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it's not grit. It's plastic. Like micro, it's plastic micro beads. beads. Oh, so some of it's salt. Some of the ones, like the expensive ones, are like most salt of scrubs, them are plastic. Most are plastic beads. Um, so they banned them. Uh, cotton buds is another big one where uh, you know the the plastic bit between the two tips, that the Q-tip things. Yeah. Uh, they're now banned, so it has to be cardboard now. So it's all these small steps from like a government level that they're trying to. But I mean, we've said it before in the podcast. You do all of these things, and you think you're doing a good job, and then you go to places like India the Middle East and then you just go great my 10 plastic bags did a great job when you see the trash that they're just throwing straight into the ocean and straight into the rivers developing countries yeah right yeah developing countries that can't afford to do things like that just yet yeah we and we all did it oh dude the United States class act when it came to wrecking the shit out of this place when (laughs) we went to the industrial revolution yeah I mean well we we all the UK is you have have to go through I think you have to go through that to get to the other side side, exactly exactly we're just like ridiculing people that are still going through it but I mean don't get me wrong the UK is still not saints I mean I imagine the US is probably doing it as well but um I mean, I didn't realize a huge amount of our recycling in the UK they basically put it in a shipping container and sent it it to to China. China And China's not been able to recycle it, so guess what? They're just putting in landfill in China. So oh. we're just shipping one problem from our UK to the other side of the world. There was a big <laughs> documentary that came out about that, and we all thought that we were, all that recycling stuff was, yeah, that was it, conscience clean. Yeah, uh-uh. so it's all going on ships and going to China because you know they are trying to recycle bits, especially phones and electronics. A lot of it's got gold and silver, and it's worth a lot of money. But you know all the rest of the bits, they didn't. Now they don't know what to do with it because they've just got too much, and it's just sitting in big containers and shipyards, just rotting. So yeah, it's not all squeaky clean, and you're recycling and saving the planet. You know, it's being shifted from one place to another. <laughs> Well, to We're answer not- your question, as a hunter, <laughs> I don't know how I do anything more than try to be but observative of exactly. things like that. Exactly. There are small things like that yeah, you can do. Small things like we that. We can change what we can control. Yes. Yes. And I think we, we just need to all be conscious of controlling that because that's all we can do. Yep. And bit by bit, as time goes on, hopefully more people will follow suit and more countries will pull through and. And one of my excuses for going out, me personally, for going outdoors has been hunting. And by going outdoors and going hunting, I've started to appreciate and understand the natural ebbs and flows of, of the natural environment around me. So it makes me care about it. Because you understand your impact more. Because I am, yes, absolutely. And I see what it's brought to my life, and I want to pass it on to the future generations. It's more, I think about that more than anything. It's like, what are we leaving for them? You know? For our children, for even if we don't have children, I'm talking about my nieces, nephews, your kids, hopefully my kids. What are we leaving for them? I want to leave them something. It's really special, you know. And hopefully, leave it better than we found it. Man, and I'm sure that's that's definitely stealing somebody's quotes from somewhere. Oh, Probably yeah. some North yeah. American great grandfather of conservation i think of course and i think that's probably uh um, I, i'd love to just carry on talking for of course hours but you guys and, are going bison hunting well anymore. he's going bison hunting and i think we've probably taken up enough of your time but it's, i've, oh, man, I've thoroughly enjoyed, enjoyed this conversation it's been Absolutely. awesome I've, and i hope we can connect again at some point in the future uh, you guys are always welcome here thanks very much cookie dinner anytime 
Thank you. Yeah, man. Thanks for listening to the show. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed re-editing uh, the show. I completely forgot we had a big discussion on ants. Did you have some chuckles? I did. It made me laugh. So, um, yeah. It turned out that we found out afterwards that um, Brett's fiance is also mad on insects. Well, that's how it started. Oh, was that in, in the, the podcast? podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's how it started. So, But uh, you, you ended up talking to her for about like, 45 yeah, minutes after, after the podcast. After it. Just about ants. It's, mm. It was hilarious. Uh, but join us again in two weeks' time. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to be on the show, but I think we're going to try and get a gamekeeper or something on. That's yeah, that's the plan. the plan. We're going to try and get somebody on next week. Because we, we, want, we want to get a few more people from the UK on because we've had a lot of guests out with uh, over recent months. A bar Sam, um, but he's been on twice, so we, we need some new blood. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, so, yeah, we're, the, the next show, we don't know who it is yet, but it will be someone from the UK. But we can tell you that the following one after that is going to be with Eduardo Garcia. Which who, we talked about before, that you did. need to go and see his film now because you will appreciate the podcast even more if you have seen his film, Charged, which is on Amazon Prime. So it's free on Amazon Prime UK. Or get your wallet out. Spend the nine ninety nine. It'll be worth it, I yeah. promise you. Definitely. If you want to contact the show, it is podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. Our website is all the W's, thepacebrothers.com. And that is also where you can donate and find out all the information you need about pangolins, podcasts, films, everything that you can think of. Uh, A big thank you to the people that have been leaving reviews. I've noticed there's been a few more reviews being uh, left on there. And if you, we would really appreciate it if you haven't left a review, if you do. And if you can't be bothered typing, then just scroll down. And if you're using iTunes, I'm not sure about the other apps because I don't use all of them. Uh, But if you're on iTunes, scroll down to the bottom of where our page is and then you'll see a little star system. Slap five stars on that, baby, please. Hmm. And I should have really talked about this at the start, but we have launched a photography competition, which is going to be run at, well, the winner is going to be announced at the Northern Shooting Show. So the detail, the initial details of that are up on uh, the Facebook page, uh, on the Pace Brothers Facebook page, and a lot more details will be coming up next week. So just keep it in your mind that if you like taking photos or you've taken photos in the past and uh, you think you have a particularly good one, there's some pretty broad categories, so basically anything in the outdoors, you'll probably be able to find a category that fits, then stick it aside and we will give you all the details on the next podcast. Yes, we will, yeah so that you can get entering. Um, there's some great prizes. We've got about 250 odd pounds worth, of, or maybe more, of prizes to win for each category. So it's going to be worth entering. Yeah, well, exactly, because who knows? It might actually be worth more than 250 pounds. It could be, because we're trying to do some We're trying to do some, some deals. Deals. We're always working for the people. <laughs> always. <laughs> but I am looking forward to the Northern Shooting Show. It's going to be upon us before we know it. And it was going to be our first show of the year. Uh, you you know what I love is that of all the shows, and we've talked about it since day one we started this podcast, Schoon Game Fair, is, it's our local game fair and it's one of our favourite to go to. But the Northern Shooting Show, we've gone from the year it started. Yeah. And it is the one show that is talked about so much now. Like yeah. I hear so many more people talking about the Northern Shooting Show uh, and really positively, and we think it's a great show. And if you live in that area, it's one hundred percent worth going. It really, it really. It's a good is. location in the country. It's a good you location. Can get to it from a lot yeah. of places. Really good location. Harrogate, Harrogate Showgrounds, where it's at. And Harrogate's really nice. <laughs> it's a very nice place. Yeah. <laughs> so a, do- a double win-win. If if you you could always leave um, uh, your your wife in town, or if you are a woman that likes to shoot and your husband doesn't, leave him <laughs> leave, him, leave in him in town. <laughs> Or if you both like, you go to the the fair, but it's it's a nice town to go around. It is. And we're going to have our teepee tent there. There's going to be another sort of talk area, and then we're going to be joined by a few other people in the kind of area that we were in last year. Mm -hmm. So it should be good. Join us again in two weeks' time. 